Welcome, everyone. I'm excited to have today Marty Boardman. And if you don't know him, he has a very, very good story, and I'm excited to dive into it. Marty, welcome to the podcast today. Appreciate you coming on. Thank you. My pleasure to be here. Awesome. Awesome. So uh, the way that I found Marty here, kind of an interesting story. Uh, if you guys seen my YouTube video all about bigger pockets, I was doing research on it and I came across Marty Boardman. He was actually the guest for the first episode of the Bigger Pockets podcast. Is that right, Marty? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Who knew that it would uh, become so popular uh, when I agreed to do it? I'm like, eh, okay, I didn't even know what podcasts were. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah. I think it's safe to say that you are a large part of the reason bigger pockets blew up. I think that would be a, a correct statement, right? <laughs> well, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I'd hate to take uh, that kind of credit for for the uh, the the network they've created, the kind of the safe space they've created for real estate investors of all types to to come and gather. Uh, and uh, you know, Josh Dorkin and uh, Brandon Turner just did a phenomenal job uh, with uh, and have done, continue to do a phenomenal job with growing uh, that community. And it's a cool place to be a part of, that's for sure. It's, it's neat to be a part of the origin story, I guess. Uh, at yeah, least the podcast yeah. side. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's awesome. Um, I'm curious, how did, you, how did you get that? How did you end up being the first guest? Were you like friends with them or Josh or how did that work? Not really. Uh, so what happened is about, uh, well, when the housing market crashed in 2008, I started a, a blog uh, called flippingphoenixhouses.com. And it was really just a, a place for me to go and talk about everything that happened uh, leading up to the crash and following the crash to me personally. It was just kind of a way for me to, it's therapeutic. It was for me for, to talk to people about what happened and just kind of get it all out in the open. And I was writing about it, writing about these things probably one, two, three times a week. And, uh, you know, the, the site itself kind of, I don't want to say went viral. I don't know what the term would be. Just, it was very popular with SEO searches. People are always interested in flipping houses in Phoenix, that word combination. And the fact that I was writing so frequently and right. constantly creating new content, um, made it very, you know, high up in the search engine, uh, organic searches. So, uh, I ended up, um, I think, uh, I ended up through that being invited to write a series of columns for Inman uh, real estate right. uh, website, uh, or actually, I think what it was is they were looking for somebody to do it. And I entered, I don't know if it was like a contest or just a, uh, something along those lines. And they liked the way I wrote, they liked my story. So they had me come in and be a guest writer for three articles. Uh, so, uh, and then Joshua saw that those articles on Inman and liked, again, my story and the fact that uh, I was an investor and invited me to be a regular contributor to their, to their blog, to their website. So I, I think I wrote, I don't know, at least one or two posts for them uh, a week or a month. I don't recall what it is. Now you can still find them on, on bigger pockets. And eventually, you know, as the housing market started to kind of correct and come back you know i got back on my feet again and rebuilt my business and i would write about that on bigger pockets and they decided to start this podcast and thought i think because a lot of the articles i wrote were were pretty popular got a lot of uh you're a safe bet yeah, safe bet so, for the first episode yeah and with all the engagement yeah. that my uh my my blog posts were getting on their website they invited me to to do that podcast yeah awesome awesome well it's great man yeah one reason that I, I think it, uh, I really wanted to bring you on right now, um, I've seen a lot of uh, people talking about the economy and the economy crashing. People are at least worried about the economy crashing. Who knows what's going to happen over the next six to 12 months? Um, but you've gone through it. You've gone through it with the last market crash, the Great Recession. You lost millions and millions and millions of dollars. And I think you have some wisdom to share with people who are worried that this may happen to them in the upcoming crash. Um, so can you just tell me, uh, tell us a little bit about what happened maybe, maybe prior to 2008, kind of what your real estate business was like. I knew that you used to be a TV cameraman, uh, yeah. which is pretty, which is pretty cool, man. So maybe you can talk about just a little bit. We don't have to go super far into it, but just yeah. like your journey from like reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad, like me and everybody else getting into yeah. it up until, um, you know, you built this big portfolio before the market crash. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. So prior to getting into real estate, uh, I was a TV news cameraman. I worked uh, where I still live in Phoenix uh, at the CBS affiliate. And uh, it's a very demanding job. Uh, it requires you work nights, weekends, holidays. Uh, you know, the pay's not very good. There's not a lot of flexibility in your schedule. You kind of have to go where you're told and do what people want when they want. And uh, I traveled a lot in the beginning all over the country. And then when budgets started getting cut all over, just all over the state, covering the state. And so uh, in 2001, there was a huge, uh, uh, I guess it was 2002, there was like a half a million acre brush, uh, half a million acre brush fire uh, up north of Phoenix. And I was stuck covering this story for weeks and didn't get to come home and see my wife. And I had a, you know, we wanted to start having a family. And I'm like, this is no way to, to live. I want to have more flexibility to, you know, be home, attend my kids' birthday parties and, and karate tournaments or soccer, whatever it is that they were doing. So uh, I had to get out. And I, I knew I wanted, initially, I wanted to go thinking I wanted to just go into a regular corporate type of nine to five job where at least I had regular hours, steady pay Come and, uh, yeah. you know, a normal, you know, four week, three to four week vacation time I could take. And so I started Makes applying to, to different corporate video uh, production places to, to work. And I, I wanted to be in some kind of business I knew, but no one would hire me. I mean, all I knew how to do was schlep around hundred pounds of camera gear. I mean, I had no marketable skills. So, and around this time I was, I'd acquired a couple of rentals. My wife and I bought a couple of rental properties just so we were, you know, uh, what well, they were dual income, no kids dinks, they call this dual income, no kids. So we did have some, a lot of disposable income. So we were able to invest in a couple of rental properties. And I was interested in that and started doing what a lot of new real estate investors do. I was going to you know, free weekend boot camps and seminars and started buying books and tapes uh, and CDs on how to do this stuff. And so, uh, yeah, I just, uh, uh, and of course, read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, like a lot of other people do and, and went through that whole process and just decided, yeah, I mean, if I can't get a job, a regular kind of nine to five corporate job, I've got to have to start my own business. And real estate seems like kind of the lowest barrier to entry. Uh, you don't need you know, a, a degree, you can, you can learn kind of how to do it. So I don't know that there was really YouTube back then, but you know, right. you could read books, you could attend workshops and pick things up here and there uh, and, and learn how to do it. So that's kind of how I transitioned from being a TV news camera into real estate. So, so 2000, did I'm you, sorry. was that, is that like real estate was like your backup plan in a way, because you couldn't get the full-time job was, am I understanding that right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, it, it just kind of occurred to Worked me one out, day yeah. that I, the real estate is, you know, I was 30 years old and, uh, you know, I wasn't going to be able to go back to school and learn, you know, for four more years and learn something new. I had, you know, a wife and kids. I had to figure out how to make money quickly. Yeah, right. uh, so it just occurred to me that, you know, real estate investing was the way to go. And I knew, uh, like I said, it would give me the freedom and the, even if I, the freedom and the flexibility uh, to, to, you know, be home and to kind of create my own schedule. And so this was the selling point. This is how I convinced my wife to let me quit. Uh, she still worked full time. I made $53,000 a year and with overtime, probably closer to 60 to $65,000 a year. As a said, cameraman. Yeah, as a cameraman. And I said, I think I could make at least that much money in real estate. Uh, and the upside would be that I would have the flexibility. I wouldn't have to, you know, be gone, you know, sometimes weeks on end and be coming home late at night or getting called out early in the morning. So that was mm. kind of the selling point. She's like, okay, well, I think, yeah, you could probably do that. So that was how I, you know, convinced her to allow me like to quit it. so I could pursue it uh, full time. So, yeah. So this was back way back in 2002. So I've been doing real estate now 20 years, uh, longer than I was in the television industry. It's crazy to think about because it seemed wow. like I worked in TV forever, but yeah, 20 years. So I was 11 at that time, 2002. Yeah. No, thanks for making me feel, you know, <laughs> hey, you look good, man. You look good. I don't know if it's the camera, but you look good, dude. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thanks. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I just turned 50 this year. So, oh, congratulations. Uh, I mean, thanks. I, if, I, if I look like you when I'm 50, man, I'm happy, man. That's, that's <laughs> awesome. I appreciate that. Thank you. So, 
So yeah, it's because I didn't have to schlep around camera gear anymore, right? It saved my body, it saved my uh, saved my my face, I guess, from all the sun and the heat and, <laughs> and the all the elements. But brush uh, fires, yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so yeah, so I got I transitioned out of that and in, into into real estate. And uh, again, I just kind of this was two thousand two, and the, I would say the housing market then was fairly stable. There was, you know, a, a decent amount of supply. There were buyers, there were sellers. It was just kind of right in the middle, I would say. Uh, so it was a good time to get into the business. And up until that point, I'd always been told real estate's always stable. There's not a lot of highs and lows. It just kind of slowly appreciates three, four, five percent a year. And uh, you know, as long as you're, you know, good with your numbers, you're you, you should be safe. So nothing like it has been the last decade and a half, right? So. Anyway, so yeah, I got into to that in 2002, and I went to a seminar on uh, a weekend seminar. It was in Denver, actually, where Bigger Pockets' headquarters are, and it was a weekend uh, workshop where uh, they had speakers come in on Saturday and Sunday. Uh, four, I think there was four or five of them Saturday, four or five of them on Sunday. They who was had, it? Who who hosted it? It was um, uh, Bill. Uh, he was a he's a real estate attorney, but he also uh, okay. does, um, uh, I can't think of his name, uh, uh, but uh, he does real estate uh, and he's a real estate attorney as well. But his thing was sandwich lease options. That was his big okay. coaching program that he offered. But there were others. There was like a number of guys that came up. They would take the stage for an hour and a half and they would pitch you on their program. And then you would uh, go to the, you know, of course, everyone would go running to the back of the running room with the their credit, credit cards, cards uh, you yeah, know, right, exactly. to buy their now that back then, you know, you, I mean, I think his program was William Bronchick. His name was William Bronchick. And I think this was hosted with through the Col Colorado Real Estate Association or Real Estate okay. Investors Association. So anyway, so yeah. Uh, so I bought his course on sandwich lease options and I bought another course from a guy on foreclosures. So, cause those things interest me. I was interested in the sandwich, sandwich lease option strategy because it didn't take any money to do. Um, and I was interested in foreclosures because I felt like, wow, people in foreclosure are probably the most motivated sellers on the planet. And it seems like that would be a good place to go as well. So I got back and I did my uh, sandwich lease option. I set up all my marketing and flyers and all this stuff. And I, I actually closed a couple of deals doing this sandwich lease option strategy. And I made, I don't know, 20, 30,000 bucks. And that got me pretty excited. And that was the breaking point, that was where my wife was like, okay, yeah, you can, you can quit now. You've made, you've made almost half your salary in like three months. So yeah, go You're ahead. Good. Yeah. So, so that's kind of where it started, but sandwich lease options are really difficult to do. There's a lot of moving parts and you've got to get people who aren't necessarily uh, real estate experts or even, you know, very understand they barely understand how to buy a house and then you're trying to explain to them how a sandwich lease option works it's like i lease it from you and then i'm going to lease option to somebody else and i make your payments and blah 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 so it, it was just very difficult to implement so that's when i kind of went to the next set of uh at this time it was cassette tapes and like a big thick three ring binder notebook on foreclosures yeah. i'm like okay i think this is a better way to go because i i just want to talk to people who have to sell They're, they have to do something Simpler, simpler yeah. business. Yeah, exactly. So at, then what I started doing is I started printing out lists of people in foreclosure and just door knocking. I'd go to their home and knock on wow. their door and see if they wanted to sell. And you it, did that. You actually went on people's doors and with door knocking. I did that That's... for a year and a half. I knocked on anywhere what? between 60 and 80 doors a weekend for almost two years. Yep. That is great. So why did you go door knocking? For me, when I got started, man, like People are like, oh, door knock, door knock. You know, you're not serious if you're not going out willing to door knock. I am too scared to door knock, man. I, I was doing like direct mail, internet marketing and stuff. And and why did you choose door knocking? Was that like in the program or is that just what the budget was? Like to me, door knocking is is the most painful out of all of them to, yeah. to get deals. Well, here's the thing. And this is a, a great uh, tip, hopefully, to start uh, people off with. Uh, you're not randomly, I wasn't randomly knocking on doors, walking up and down streets, okay? <laughs> yeah. I had a list of people who were in foreclosure. Those were people who, whether they really wanted to or not, had to do something. They had to sell. So, and I, you know, it's a very strategic process. I mean, I wouldn't just print them out then and go drive them. I would print them out. 
I would check with the attorney who was handling the foreclosure if the case was still pending. If I, so those two things, number one, they had to be in foreclosure. Number two, their case still had to be pending. So when I knocked on that door, I knew that person that answered or didn't answer, they were still in foreclosure. They had to do something. So that changes the game, really, if you think about it. From a, If you're afraid of door knocking, I don't blame you. I would suck. I don't, I mean, I have guys coming by my house all the time. They're trying to sell me solar panels, uh, pest control. They want me to change my cable subscription, right? What a Doing crappy religion. job that would be, right? <laughs> Yeah, but the, the yeah. way I look at it, uh, Tim, is this: like, uh, if if your house was on fire and somebody was driving by and saw smoke, uh, wouldn't you hope that they at least knocked on your door to see if you needed some help, right? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's what that's this is point. like. Their house is on fire, and if you have the skill set to help them out of that foreclosure, uh, it's almost irresponsible of you not to knock on the door and go, Hey, you know, can you use mm. some help with this? Cause is there something I can do to help you out with this? Cause especially nowadays people get bombarded with direct mail, uh, text message blasts, you know, yep. there's signs all over. If you live in a big city, I buyers, we buy houses, make, I mean, I mean, they're, they're confused. They're in denial or apathetic. They don't know what to do. So if you can show up in the door uh, and coherently explain uh, a solution to their problem and let them know what their options are, then, then there's a good chance you can make a deal with them. So again, Interesting. so yeah, that's what I did. And I did that for about two years. And then I made a lot of money. That's why I built up uh, an empire of, you know, over, you know, 6 million, $8 million. I was actually $8 million in real estate. Question, uh, that, question yeah. before we go into that, I know I, I keep interrupting you, but I have okay. like these questions that pop up. Um, so did you, when you were door knocking, and this is really interesting me because I have never talked to anyone who like seriously did it for that yeah. long. Um, did you have any like nightmare stories or someone like come to the door and like put a gun to your head or something crazy? Like for me, that's the worst case scenario is like uh -huh. a guy shows up with a shotgun and is like, get off my property, you know, or something yeah. like that. Actually, I had more people threaten me when I was a TV news cameraman <laughs> <laughs> really? than, than uh, with, with okay. violence uh, than I ever did door knocking. I had one example and I know we'll talk about this later uh, that I, I wrote about in a book I just wrote about uh, door knocking and foreclosures, but I talk about it in the book, but I had one guy. So I had a little 1995 Honda Accord and um, I would use Solid that car. To, 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 you know, it was a reliable car, got good gas mileage. I mean, I had a nicer car as well, but that's what I did to door knock. I drove that. So I pulled up to his house and I knock on his door and I couldn't even hardly get two words out of my mouth. And he's like, uh, he's like, where's your bank? And I, I'm like, what, what are you talking about? Where's your bank? He's like, where's your bank at? And I'm like, oh, it's around the corner from here. And he's like, he's like, if you really have cash and you can buy my house and stop my foreclosure, let's go to your bank right now. I'm like, okay, sure. Let's go. I call this block, you know? And he's like, bull effing S H I T. He's like, you haven't got a pot to piss in. Cause if you did, you wouldn't be driving that piece of you know, S-H-I-T, and he points to my Honda Accord I pulled up in. I'm like, geez, okay, man. All right, well, I guess, I guess, you know, this isn't really going anywhere. I don't really, I just said, listen, I'm sorry to bother you. I'm sorry, this is so upsetting for you. I, I, I'll leave you alone. And I went, hopped in the car and started to drive away. And then he hopped in his truck and got like right behind me and like was like tailgating me all the what? way out of the subdivision. And when I finally went to make a right turn out, he went left. And so I guess that was the end of that. But yeah, I mean- wow. Uh, for the most part, people were always at least respectful and uh, continue to be. I mean, this is a strategy uh, I, I use now. I mean, I don't do it myself, but I, I work with people who do and uh, uh, coaching clients and, and just, you know, people that, that want to learn how to do this. But um, interesting. Uh, so did you, yeah, I had like... one late, I'll tell you one other quick story. Okay, I, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I knocked on the door and uh, uh, I, I said, Hey, I'm here to talk to you about the situation with your house and your mortgage. And she's like, Oh no, no, I'm not worried about it. It's, it's in God's hands. And I'm like, well, who do you think sent me? <laughs> you know, she still didn't, she still didn't want to do it. Didn't work. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, it's, um, it's a, like I said, it's, if you're strategic about it, then you, you typically aren't going to be wasting a lot of time because you know, you're knocking on the door of somebody who is motivated, but probably isn't really thought about how they're going to solve this problem. And again, if you, if you're, if you're dressed nicely, if you're, you know, you speak confidently and coherently, and you can again, explain their options. It's really two options. Like you have two options. You bring your loan current 
pay or pay your loan off uh, or your house goes to auction. So, you know, or you, and then you lose everything. So those are your two options. You pay your loan off, bring your loan current to stop the foreclosure, or you let the house go to auction. Those are your choices. What, which choice would you rather make? You want to lose the house at auction? You know, so yeah, it's a, it's a simple conversation to have. You know, that, that guy has a point though. Like to me, I would be thinking the same thing. Like if you're driving around a 95 Honda Accord, you know, you want to buy the guy's house. You said that you had a nicer car. What's the reason that you decided to, to opt to drive one that was, you know, the less nice one? Because I, I would think that multiple people might have the same idea. And if you drove up in, you know, an Audi or something, you might have more success. I'm curious on your thoughts there. Well, I guess it's just, you know, a psychology thing. I mean, uh, for, I, you know, like I look at like someone like my wife, my wife doesn't know how much cars cost. She doesn't know the difference between what a BMW costs and a Honda Accord. Doesn't really something that's on her radar. And most people are in this situation, at least the ones that you know, you can help. That's not a thought, that's, care. you know, in yeah. their brain. And, and, uh, if you drive up in an Audi or a Audi or a BMW, people are going to think, wow, this guy's getting rich, ripping people off who are in foreclosure. True, right. So true. It's I'd rather go, can't I'd rather go the much. more modest approach, you know, and mm. uh, drive something that's a little bit more modest. And, and, and usually you might want to park a, a house or two down, you know, like a detective would, so they don't see you coming, right. You just kind of, kind of ring the doorbell and they don't see what you're driving, but over the years, it, it really hasn't mattered much. Uh, the people, uh, hundreds and hundreds of these uh, door knocking uh, foreclosure deals I've done, the the, the people that um, uh, I bought from wasn't even a thought in their in their head. It was how can this person solve my problem? Is he trustworthy? Is he somebody that uh, you know I know uh, I can count on to to stop my foreclosure and give me the money. Uh, that I need to get, uh, you know, here at the here at the closing, and then later on down the road when I move out. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah, and that guy probably wouldn't have sold you the house anyway, even if you drove up. That was probably oh, just no. his, you know. Yeah. No. So. Yeah, it's gotcha. very difficult uh, to make a deal with somebody who's angry, right? I say people in foreclosure uh, have really kind of four emotional states they're in. They're they're confused. Uh, they're apathetic. Uh, they're in denial or they're angry, right? And the ones that are in denial uh, or apathetic or confused, you can usually put a deal together with somebody like that, you know, with the right presentation and, and patience. Uh, you, can, you can help them understand what their situation is and why it's beneficial to them to sell the house to you prior to the auction. Because again, you can put money in their pocket. You can give them extra time to move out. Because the alternative is it sells at auction. The auction buyer that doesn't give the owner of that house a penny. They don't get anything. Uh, and, and, and on top of that, they can, depending upon what state you're in, have that person removed from the home pretty quickly. Because as soon as you go from being the owner of the house uh, to the, not the owner of the house as a result of the auction, you're considered by law to be a squatter. You're not even a tenant. You're a squatter in the house. So they treat you like that. So they can just throw you out. So and you, when you get someone to understand that that's your other option, it's like, well, listen, let me buy the house from you. I'll give you X amount of dollars. I'll give you 30 days, 60 days to move out. And I'll give you some more money when you're gone. That's, you can move out with dignity. That's a much better uh, alternative. Gotcha. 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 Okay. But yeah. yeah like, so, so anyway, the, going back to the emotional stuff, like, yeah, yeah I, I can't really think of a, a homeowner I've ever approached who was uh, angry uh, that, uh, you know, didn't, uh, that, that made a deal uh, with me, you know, what they ended up doing something else. So. <laughs> gotcha. 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 Yeah. yeah. I, I, I do want to dive into your, um, kind of the, the, you know, rags to riches story or riches yeah. to rags or whatever, but I'm very interested in this door knocking thing as well. I just, I find it, um, very fascinating because it's something like, I think a lot of people probably aren't doing and maybe could be doing now. I don't know if you, a spoiler, if you're like, that's in your book. And that's one of your strategies you're promoting that works today. But, um, and we can go into that now. I think it's like natural. We're already talking about it, but, um, what kind of percentage of people when you door knock, like how many homes did it actually take, um, to do, to get a deal and how many people like actually were at the door, you know, or do you like leave a postcard behind or something, you know? Yeah. So there's definitely a strategy behind it. So, uh, I would never 
the first thing you got to remember is, and again, this varies state to state. I tell people the foreclosure process, like you like Mexican food, Tim, do you I love like Mexican food? Dude. Yeah. I'm, I live in San Diego, man. Yeah. So there you go. So I'm in Phoenix, right? So, I mean, we're two of the meccas of, of, right. of Mexican food, right? So I love it. And there, I mean, and every restaurant you go to has a different kind of salsa, right? I mean, and I love salsa. I love chips and salsa. So they all have a different twist on salsa. And I tell people like the best way to think of the foreclosure process is, is our 50 United States as being 50 different Mexican restaurants with a different kind of salsa. The process works different from state to state. It's not universal. So uh, the first thing you got to do if you're going to buy foreclosures and you live in South Carolina or you live in Nebraska is you got to figure out how the process works there. But most cases, really, this is the same in all states. A homeowner usually has at least 30 days and sometimes 90 days and even longer to bring their loan current or pay their loan off. So you're really kind of wasting your time. If you show up at the door of somebody who's in foreclosure who just got their notice yesterday or last week when they've got weeks or months to solve the problem, they're not going to want to talk to you. I mean, they in their brain, they've got they can put the house on the MLS and sell it. They can maybe refinance it. They can, you know, they have other options besides selling it to the guy who shows up or gal who shows up on their doorstep. Right. So it'd so, be like the 90 day one, right? I guess yeah. they were, they're like, they're, I guess it depends on the state, but like people who are less than a month out from actually being foreclosed. Yeah. Out. Well, I'll give you an example. I have a coaching client here in Phoenix and uh, him and I talked, he just, we started working together about three months ago and he's like, Marty's like, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this door knocking stuff. And he was doing this. He hadn't read my book. He hadn't, he just, he had heard or read somewhere or saw something that said, this is a good way to, to find uh, and buy foreclosures. And I'm like, well, well, tell me how you you're doing this. And he's like, well, I, I go out, uh, I get the notice and uh, download it from the County recorders website, which they're published daily, you know, uh, here in Maricopa County. And I print them out and I write the address down and I go drive by. I'm like, well, that's your first mistake. I'm like, these people have 90 days to, to bring their loan current or pay it off. They're not going to want to talk to you. I'm like, mm -hmm. stop doing that. I was like, I wouldn't even start going and talking to these, these homeowners until it's two weeks away from their auction. Now there's urgency. Now they're motivated. Now they have to do something and there's no time to sell it uh, the traditional means through the MLS. There's no time to refinance it because uh, the you know a, a refi takes 30 days or more, and they're 90 to 120 days past due, so they don't have the credit uh, worthiness to do it. I said, so now you're going to be really helping people who who are desperate, right? So I told them stop doing that two weeks and 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 sooner. So and I said, and the second thing you want to do is in that notice is the name of the attorney. There's going to be a phone number or a website call that number or go to that website and verify that that foreclosure case is still active because it isn't, if it isn't active, then you're going to really make them mad because you're going to show up at their house and want to talk to them about a foreclosure that that's been canceled. You know, yeah, they brought their you, right? own current, yeah. they're not in foreclosure. So they're going to be really ticked off at you. So don't do that. So, so he changed his approach. I said, honestly, I wouldn't even go there till a week before. So he started going out uh, seven days beforehand. And within two weeks, he got his first deal door knocking. Uh, two and, you, weeks. and you can like, for me, uh, my state was Delaware, but it was hard for me to even get the title and like all the ducks in a row and the cash lined up and everything in that short of a time period. Usually yeah. we do like 30 days. So how does that work? I mean, if someone said, Hey, I'm foreclosing in a week, like that would be like, that would be really tight to actually make that, make that happen. How do you go about doing that? Or is that just well, maybe depends on the state? Yeah. Well, it, it does. It, Yes and no. I mean, the thing about it is, is you've got to have, th there's some risk involved in this and you've got to be willing to take on some of that risk. You can't close uh, a deal with someone who's in foreclosure 24, 48, even 72 hours prior to the auction uh, without taking a little bit of risk. Uh, and you're, you're not going to be able to close the deal with a traditional title company. So here are the steps. Uh, if you have a home seller who's in foreclosure and they're a week or sooner away, uh, from their auction and, and the title company can't close the deal, the very least you can do is get a title report, a preliminary title report, a letter report, an owner report, whatever it is. So you know exactly what they owe on the property or who's owed what. And if it's just a first mortgage that's foreclosing and there's nothing else, then you're pretty safe. I mean, 
you're not going to be able to get an owner's coverage policy on it from a title company, but you can still buy the property. And that's done uh, kind of the traditional way or not traditional way, but they call it kitchen table closing. It's like you get the documents your state requires you to get to, uh, to transfer ownership from them to you. You get the title uh, or a deed of the property signed over. In, in Arizona, there's another form called an affidavit of property value. So they sign a quick claim deed or a warranty deed, affidavit of property value, which you can get notarized with a mobile notary, or you can go to a bank and do it. And as soon as you have that information, uh, or as soon as you have that signed, uh, you're also working on getting the information from the bank that you need to either bring their loan current or pay their loan off. And as soon as you have all that together, then you can give the, you get the deed signed, you get whatever other forms your state requires to sign, you give the seller their cash, uh, you go record that deed. So now you own the house and then you send the rest of the money to their bank so you can stop the foreclosure. Interesting. Interesting. And how, like, is this something you're doing today? Like how profitable is this strategy? I really don't see everyone's talking about, you know, artificial intelligence and all this stuff. Yeah. What you're talking about is like traditional, like, boom, like, let's do it. You know, like, let's yeah. go to the door knock and, and save people from traditional foreclosure. And like, it, how much money can people actually make doing this today? Well, I mean, here's the thing. Uh, when you're, we are in a market now where people have equity, right? I mean, home values, you know, where you live, where I live, really all over the country. I do this in Wisconsin as well. And, uh, you know, v v home values have, have skyrocketed, you know, yeah. six, eight, 10, 12% a year for the last five, six years. So most people in this situation have some equity, right? So then it really just becomes a matter of, how good of a deal can you negotiate with that seller, right? I mean, if and then what's your exit strategy going to be? I mean, if it's to fix right. and flip, obviously you've got to factor in, you know, whatever rehab costs are involved. If it's going to be a house you want to live in, or if it's a house you plan to rent, you know, what are your numbers look like there? What's your return on invest going to, going to be after you acquire the house or model it? And what kind of money can you make after you put a tenant in the property? But most home sellers uh, in foreclosure right now have some equity and most likely have a very low interest rate, which is a whole nother strategy you can add to this foreclosure strategy. For example, now I just closed a deal, a uh, pre-foreclosure deal, uh, door knock deal uh, with one of my clients uh, that I partnered with. And uh, so he went door knocking, he found the deal, he came to you, you showed him the ropes and you guys are yeah, partnering up. On exactly. It. So, I mean, the, the mortgage on the house was $232,000. The house was worth four and a quarter, 425. Now it's in really bad shape, but you know, a hundred thousand dollars, 75 to hundred grand can make it really nice. And the underlying mortgage on the property was uh, only 3%. The, the loan was 3%. So the payment is a thousand bucks a month. So that was a no brainer for us. You know, we took the okay. title subject to, we sent the bank $12,000 to bring the loan current, uh, gave the seller 30,000 bucks. And now we've got a house that we're most likely going to, I haven't started it yet. I'll start next week, probably do a fix and flip with it. Uh, I may keep it as a rental. We'll just see, you know, how the numbers look when we're all done, but it could work either way. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. Okay. Very cool. So what, what are the numbers on door knocking? Like this guy, how many times did he have to go door knocking to actually find a, find a deal? And how much time do you think it took him to do it? Uh, I'd say he probably spent about 30, 40 hours on it. Yeah. I mean, I would say this. So the game has changed quite a bit. There were a lot more foreclosures when I got into this in 2002, 2003. I mean, I, I, there are still actually about the same amount volume wise foreclosures today as there was back then. We were foreclosing on, well, there was about four to 600 foreclosures a month uh, in, that actually went to auction, houses that actually went to auction back in 2003, 2000. In the country or in? No, your, in Arizona, Arizona where I live. Okay, yeah, so yeah, I'm yeah. just giving you some numbers here in Arizona. Sure. So that number is, there's, there's, that number is a lot less. Now, fewer and fewer people are actually losing their home to auction because there are more people out there doing direct mail and text blasting. So people have more options right now. Uh, so there's fewer doors to actually go knock on than there were. Uh, in 2002, 2003, you might have, like, I was, I was knocking, you know, anywhere between 40 and 60, 80 doors a weekend. 
Now it might only be 10 or 12, right? So uh, there's a lot fewer people getting to the point where, you know, they're two weeks away uh, from, from actually losing their home. So I would spend almost as much time back then as, as I would now, because back then there were more uh, houses to go to, but they were, I could route them. So they were all really close together, you know? Now there might only be 10 and they're spread out. So I got, you know, I got to go, you know, right. drive, you know, 20 minutes in between houses. So I would say that it's about right now, it's about 25 to 30 doors, you know, to get a deal. Yeah. That, that's not, oh, that must be like, that's because that's because it's a targeted, like these are a targeted list of people who like really need to sell. So that exactly, that exactly. And uh, you can figure out pretty quickly like it might be 25 to 30 new doors uh, to get one, but there's going to be a couple that you're going to have to go back to. I mean, it's like, it's like being in a, in a sales job. I mean, you, I mean, right. you're not going to show up. I tell my clients, I tell people, you're not going to show up at the door of somebody's house and they go, Oh, thank goodness you're here. You know, where do I sign to sell my house to you? Right. It's going to be a process. It's usually about three touches uh, before somebody will finally say, okay, yeah, I've got to do this. You know, I've got to, I've got to sell my house to you and take your offer because I don't have any other options. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Is, is open door in your market? Yeah, they are you know? open door, um, offer pad. We They're have a huge there. company called that's local called 72 sold and yeah. they run bazillions of, uh, TV ads and they have billboards. They're the official real estate partner of the Arizona Cardinals football team. I mean, I don't mm -hmm. know how they're making any money right now. I don't know how they're doing it because from what I'm told, they're basically paying market value for houses still, even though things are, you know, on the decline. Yeah. Well, maybe that's why Zillow and Redfin both shut down their house flipping businesses because it literally was losing millions of dollars, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. I so drive I around, I live in the Southeast part of Phoenix, the East Valley, and I drive around, I see open door signs and Redfin signs all over the place. And it's interesting because those houses, uh, on average, when I look at their listings, they're just bleh, meh houses, right? There, there are people who sold that probably knew to them knowing that their house needed a lot of updating. They just, you know, were builder grade specials or whatever. So, cause I still see the houses here that are nice, that have been remodeled and, and they're still selling pretty fast. Yeah. Interesting. So how, how does, yeah, I was reading a report that like on Zillow's best year, their average profit per house they bought was negative $25,000. <laughs> it's just yeah. it's absolutely ridiculous. So, but how does someone like, like you or an investor compete when like I'm knocking on someone's door and they're like, Tim, I'm just going to call open door and they're going to buy my house, you know, hundred percent for cash. Why would I need you? And mm -hmm. honestly, to me, like, you know, I, I don't know the people's situation, but like, if that option is there, I mean, that's probably why a lot of people aren't even getting to that two week point. Cause you know, when they get their first letter, right. They can just call these companies up. So, right. I mean, how do you deal with that? To me, that's kind of depressing. Well, I don't even think about it like that. I, I you know, I, okay. I have a completely different mindset. I, I just look okay. at it like there are going to be a certain percentage of people and it's not a big percentage, but it doesn't have to be. There are going to be a certain percentage of people who no matter what options are available to them, they will choose to do nothing. They will procrastinate. They will stall because they're in denial or they're apathetic or they're confused. Right. So that's why they're there in the first place. That's probably. why they're in that situation in the first place. So I don't, you know, the people who would pick up the phone and sell the open door or offer pad or 72 sold, uh, they're not my clientele anyway. They're not uh, someone I can be able to do business with in the first place. So, uh, and that's why I don't do any direct marketing. I don't do any um, uh, postcards, letters. I don't do text blasting because I know that the people who, typically call me back are not motivated leads. They're just not. So mm. uh, I focus on those people who I know need my help and have to make a decision fast. And there may be fewer of them, but typically the margins on those deals are much, much greater. Like, I mean, right. if you're talking to 30, 40 leads a day, or you're text blasting hundred people a day, and you're getting two or three leads a day from that campaign, say you're getting like 50 leads a month, you're talking to 49 people who are not really that motivated to sell. They just want to see if you're a sucker and will pay them their asking price or even a little more for their house. And you might end up 
uh, making three, 5,000 bucks on you know, six, eight deals a month. And that's why I tell people don't focus on deal count, focus on deal quality. I mean, would you rather do, you know, 10 deals a month at, at uh, 20 grand, you know, or, or two grand each and make 20, or would you rather just do one that makes you 20,000? I'd much rather just do one. So, right, cause it's just a lot less overhead and a lot less headache and paperwork shuffling and that kind of thing. So, yeah. So to answer your question, I don't, I don't think about uh, all these people, the 98% of people who get out of foreclosure through selling their house or refinancing or bankruptcying out or getting a loan mod or a forbearance. There are still a percentage of people in this world, sadly, who no matter what the options are in front of them, choose to do nothing. Uh, and, and again, if I can be that, that, that face, and I, I look at myself as someone who, when I sit down with somebody in that situation, that uh, can educate them on what's going to happen. Like, it's like, listen, if, if you don't sell the house to me, again, you got two options here. You can sell the house to me. I can give you cash right now today when we close. I give you 30 to 60 days to move out. I'll give you more money then. And I always hold money back. I'm like, I'll give you some more money when you move out. I'll hand you another check. And uh, if you don't do that in 24 hours, your house is going to sell at auction. You're going to get nothing. And now you're squatter in the house and you're going to get thrown out. And your credit's going to be destroyed on top of it because you went from having like a 90 to 120 day pass due to a foreclosure. And now you're going to have that hanging over your head for the next decade. So gotcha. you choose what option would you rather take? You know, so those are good points. Good points. I'd, I'd like to circle back to uh, kind of your story. I'm glad I, I, we're not done talking about this, the foreclosure yeah. directing stuff is interesting, yeah. but I want to circle back a little bit uh, for the original reason. I was like, I got to get Marty on the, on the podcast. So um, b back to, okay. So you were doing door knocking, you were getting deals using the strategy. You were able to build a fairly large portfolio of rentals, right? And this is what, from 02 to 07, 08, I guess, right? right? Yes. Gotcha. Okay. So you had how many, like, what did you have, I guess, at your peak of, yeah. you know, properties? So just so people understand, like I didn't door yeah. knock, I door knocked for about a year and a half. And then I realized right. I don't have to do this anymore. I can hire people to do this for me. So mm -hmm. I had anywhere between three and five people working for me and all over the city who door would, knocking. you know, door knock and bring in these deals. Right. So my exit strategy at the time, and it was a very bad one, <laughs> uh, was it really was an acquisition strategy, but the, the back end strategy was, and, you know, even at the time I was doing it, I knew I shouldn't uh, be doing this, but I felt like I was providing, you know, the homeowner with a solution to their problem that, that they thought was good. So what I, I would do is I would buy these houses from people in foreclosure that were days, hours, minutes away from auction, and I would actually allow them to stay. So I would buy their house and get a good deal on the house, you know, get, you know, steep discount, 30, 40% below market. And then I tell them, if you want to stay in the house, I'll let you stay in the house. You can lease it from me and I'll give you an option to buy it back. And, and that would be for anywhere between 20 and $30,000 over what I bought it from, from them. So let's say I buy a house from somebody for 175 grand, uh, save them from foreclosure. I'm like, listen, you can stay here and I'll give you an option to buy it back from me. You know, and I'll give you three years to do it. Uh, and the price is 200,000. So your option price. So, and they would just do that so they could have more cash in, up, up front, right? Well, Why I mean, they, they well, no, I mean, most people, even today, who are about to get foreclosed on, one of the big reasons they haven't made a decision to sell is because they, in their brain, they think they can stay. Like, this is my home. I don't want to leave. So, so they're hunkered down. They're emotionally attached to this house. They don't want to leave. So I'd be like, okay, fine, don't leave. I'll buy it from you. You owe 160. Uh, I'll give. I'll, I'll. I'll take care of the mortgage at 160. I'll give you 15 grand on top of it when we sign. So basically, you're buying it for 175. Their mortgage at 160 and the 15,000 you give them in cash. So now you're all in at 175. And uh, um, you can buy it back for me. I'll give you an option to buy it back for three years at 200 thousand dollars. Right. So. This is just, again, very basic, simple right. you know, math, right? So I did this over and over and over and over and over again, right? I mean, hundreds of times to the point where 
I you know I would sell some of these to other investors and make you know five seven thousand bucks, and then they would keep the lease for the option. They would have the option to buy from the new owner now. So I would sell these properties to other investors. But I kept at that at the time the housing market tank. I had about fifty five of these lease option deals, right? Where uh, I had the I owned the house, and a lot of times it was fifty to sixty percent below market. So I had tons and tons of equity in them. I had all these people that had options to buy them back, which most I knew would never do it. I mean, they, they were in the situation they were in for a reason. They were, you know, hurting for money. So did anyone yeah, ever I, do it? Yeah. I had a handful of people do it, but very few. So I'm sitting there on like, you know, $16 million real estate portfolio with about 8 million in equity on paper. Right. So things were going great, but what happened? You know, the housing market collapsed. I mean, it dropped by 55, 60%, depending upon what expert you ask. So here I am with these houses uh, and, I, and I'm stuck with them because I have these tenants in place that were the former owner that have a lease with an option to buy. So I'm kind of locked in. I can't really liquidate the, the inventory. Nobody wants to buy them because they're like, they have this whole lease option thing attached to them. Other investors don't want to buy them. I can't, I can't kick the people out so I can sell them. I mean, I was just screwed. Because <laughs> they, because they had the option to buy, therefore right. you couldn't just sell it to anyone yeah, else. Yeah, I couldn't sell it to anybody else. Um, so I was just, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm, I'm locked into these things. Now that strategy mm -hmm. works great in an appreciating market, but when the market's going down, 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 and you're just every month you're going, and it got to a point where, I mean, the, you know, people just started leaving the, the lease, the former owner lease option. We're like, well, screw it. I'm not going to stay here. This house isn't worth my option to buy it is 200. It's worth 150, <laughs> you know, so I'll leave too. So, you know, by the time I was able to get everybody out, the values of the houses had all dropped below what I even paid for them. So it was just a, a really poor strategy. <laughs> so, uh, so how does, how does that, how does that work from the homeowner's point of view where they, like, do they, I guess if the value, I, I guess I just don't understand where like the money flow goes. So they're paying you rent and yeah, that's how yeah, they would pay me rent. Your, yeah. Okay. And then they would leave and then you would stop getting rent. And that's yep. why that was the problem. You stopped yep. getting rent. Yep. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So th really there's that many people you had, you said how many 50, 50, I had 50 about 55. Yeah. 55 of them. And yeah. most of them stopped paying rent. Well, they, they all, all did. Left. Yeah, eventually. What? Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, why would they, I mean, uh, the whole, the whole, and I, you know, I don't want to make this too complicated for the audience. I know it's kind of hard to follow, but I mean, the whole idea here was that they got to stay. The person that I gave the lease option to was the former owner of the house. So the own that person is now longer the, they're not the owner anymore because I bought it from them, but I gave them right. a lease with an option to buy it back. But in their mind, it's still their house, right? Right. You know, right. it's their home. That's why like, they did the deal with you. Right, exactly. So, uh, uh, but eventually it gets to a point. So they're paying you rent, right? But eventually, you know, they wake up one day and they read the news and they see what's going on in the housing market. And they go, well, I have an option to buy my house back from, from Marty for $200,000, but it's not worth that anymore. It's only worth... 180 or 150, right? So I don't want to, I don't want to buy this house back from Marty. I, I'm better off just either stopping rent, stopping rent, or just telling him I'm moving out, right? Which a lot of people did too. They're like, ah, I know I have this option, but I don't want this house anymore. See you later, right? They just Why laugh. wouldn't they just stay there though? Like if they really love the house that much that they did the deal with you in the first place, like wouldn't they just keep staying in it and paying rent? Like why would they, they couldn't afford it anymore? Is that what happened? Like, I don't, why would they move out? Well, I mean, there it was a lot going on during the the this the the housing market crash on top of everything else. So, and I, I was trying to keep it simple, but I'll, I'll a lot. I like of these, going. I like going yeah. deep. I like yeah. let's let's go into yeah. it. Yeah. So, all these the, the other mistake I made, okay, was I would, um, I took all these deals subject to the existing mortgages, their mortgages. And all of these mortgages were adjustable rate mortgages. So I would take on somebody's, I would, so, and I, so what I, so they would have a lot of the reason they got in trouble is because their mortgage adjustable rate mortgage payments were so high uh, because your rates were adjusting up. So let's just say I'll, I'll, the best way to do it is to take you through an example of one. I yes. Guess. So yes. I had a guy, 
Um, he owed, I think he owed about $235,000 on his mortgage. The house was worth about 350. Okay. So I made a deal, but the mortgage of 235,000 was an adjustable rate mortgage. So his payment was pretty high. It was like 1600 bucks a month. Uh, so what I would do is I, I went into him to the, to the meeting with him. I said, you owe 235, your payment's 1600. I said, I can buy the house from you for 250. So I can um, take care of your $235,000 mortgage. I can give you 15 grand. Uh, and then I will give you an option to buy it back from me in up to three years at say 265 is what I told him. So, you know, I make in three years, I make $30,000 if he exercises his option to buy. Right. So uh, I'm like, great. So he's like, yeah, that sounds good. I'm like, so he's like, but I can't, I said, so, you know, I would always start with trying to make their lease payment be the same as that mortgage payment that I'm taking over, right? Because I don't want to lose money every month uh, on that. So I'm like, well, can you make a $1,600 a month lease payment? He's like, I can't afford that. I'm like, well, what can you afford? He's like, well, I can afford $1,200 a month. I'm like, okay. So I'm looking at, you know, I'm looking at my numbers and I'm like, well, I can afford to lose $400 a month because I've got all this equity. I have a ton of equity in this house. I got 75, 80 grand in equity in the house uh, or more. And, um, uh, you know, so I'm going to still get the house for a really good price and I can limp along losing 400 bucks a month for a while. Uh, mm. right. So, um, so eventually, uh, you know, I, I, you know, I, I did enough of those where things were going okay. Cause I, what I would do Tim, as I would every now and then I would sell a couple of them to recoup some of the negative cash flow from the, like, so, so if I say I have 50 of them, right. Times 400 bucks a month. That's what is that? Um, 20 uh, grand, right? 20 grand, right. A month yeah. that I'm losing. So about every other month I would sell one to recoup some of my, oh, my okay. lost cash flow, Right. So eventually mm -hmm. it got to a point where I couldn't sell any of them. I'm negative cash flowing. So I had to start going back to these tenants going, Hey, listen, we got to renegotiate your lease here. Cause I can't, I'm losing 400 bucks a month on this deal. You've got to pay me more if you want to stay and keep your option. Cause uh, you know, the market's going crazy. And of course people are like, no way, not doing that. We'll just move out. So yeah, that's oh, kind of how it all okay. it was like a house of cards. It just came, you know, and then you're stuck, down. you're stuck yeah. with the bag of the mortgage Yeah, and you can't do any, well, wait, okay. But, but I mean, you, there, you had a good margin, right? You had, I mean, if the property's worth 350 and you got it for like two something, you know, once they would move out, wouldn't now the property be liquid and then you could, then you could dump it. Right. It and was, with, but the market was tanking. It was so much. Tanking. So tanking. The, oh, yeah, I mean, it dropped in gone. Phoenix, it dropped 55%, 55 to 60%. Yeah. How, yeah. and how quickly I'm just trying to understand. This is like, this is, I know this, I don't know. This it must be tough to, uh, you know, tough to talk about. Maybe, maybe not, but like, yeah. this is rough. This is rough stuff. I'm sorry that this happened to you. Yeah. But like during this time, was it just like, Scram how long did it take to go from you know what you had to i guess at all coming down i can remember i can tell you exactly when it occurred to me that i was screwed it was august of 2007 so a lot of people say the housing market crashed in eight but i started feeling it in august of 2007 so what happened you know i could i could feel this coming right so i was working with these lease option tenants a number of them just to get them out get them out of the house so I could sell and start liquidating some of this stuff, right? Uh, before the, the bottom really dropped out. So I had in August of 2007, I think I had about eight, eight of them, seven or eight of them under contract uh, to sell. I'd gotten the tenants out and I'm like, boy, if I can get eight or nine of these things off my books. And I, I remember looking at my spreadsheet, an Excel spreadsheet, and it was like $330,000 is what I would have made in August. Uh, so I'm like, if I can get 300 grand out of these things, I can, you know, I may be able to get through this. Right. And, um, all, all eight or nine of them, however many I had in escrow canceled because that was when the sub market prime market mortgage market just completely cratered. And like the two big subprime lenders, I couldn't even tell you their names. Now the two break one or two of the big subprime lenders that were the only ones left loaning people money to buy houses at this point basically went bankrupt. They went out of business. So all eight of these deals fell out of escrow in the same month. So I went from $330,000 in net profit to negative 30. 
And then I started looking at my books and I'm like, this is what it's going to be like. I mean, from, from every month, I mean, I'm going to lose 30 to $35,000 a month for the, for, from here till eternity, you know, because I, I don't have anybody that can buy any of these assets. I, people that are living in them, the ones I have left that are living in them can't pay me what at least the mortgage is. So it's, it's, it's going up in flames here. <laughs> I'm going so were down. you, were you paying, like, were you paying the 30, 40 grand a month or were you just didn't have the cash or were you just like letting them, you're like, well, I'm just I mean, that was go. the month, August of 07. It was like, I'm done. I can't, I can't do this anymore. So I'm like, I just stopped making the payments on all these houses. And I, I let all the lease option tenants that were left know, Hey, I can't make this mortgage payment anymore. Uh, so if you want, I did a couple of, I know with a couple of the, those people, I said, listen, if you want, I'll just sign the deed of the house back over to you. The loan's already in your name and you can work out whatever deal you want to work out with your lender. I did probably about a half a dozen of those. Cause I, I mean, I'm not going to be a jerk about it. I'm like, you know, I, I helped you out of a bad situation. You're still living there. This bankrupted me, <laughs> but the very, I said that, and the bankruptcy, I know I was heading towards bankruptcy. So I, I knew the bankruptcy trustee wasn't going to care uh, about any assets I had or that I gave away that had no equity. You know, I had talked to my attorney about that. He's like, just give them back to the people that you bought them from, you know, just title them back over. So I did a couple uh, of those. So, yeah. Is that the yeah. risk of the, the homeowner doing sub two deals with an investor? Is that like, I mean, this was a kind of a crazy situation, but like, that's the risk if the investor doesn't make the payments, the homeowner is kind of, well, I get you're the homeowner, but I guess like they're in a way, like they don't have control over that. Right. Oh, so they're absolutely. Kind of, I mean, yeah. I, I, I don't know that, and I don't want to crap on people's parades who are doing subject to deals, but I personally would rather uh, either <laughs> let the house, I do, I choose just about any other alternative besides letting an investor take my house title subject to. I would never do that because again, you run the risk of that investor just saying, eh, I don't want to pay that, make that payment anymore. And it has zero effect on me or my credit. So, you know, I'm out of here. And, and, you know, any number of, for any number of reasons, right. It's just it's a huge risk as a owner of a house to allow somebody to take title subject to your property. I mean, it's, I mean, and you could just, again, like, and it's, and think about it like this, Tim, like I was just um, trying to, I have a, I have about six rentals in Wisconsin where I've done a number of pre foreclosures and sheriff sale deals, foreclosure deals. And, you know, I have, like six of them, they're traditional 30 year fixed mortgages. They're all cash flowing great. And um, they're, they're solid. And I have a ton of equity in them. I bought them, some of them I bought five, six years ago, right? So I want to harvest some of the equity out of these rentals to invest in more, right? So I've talked to, and maybe somebody listening here knows someone they can reach out to me to tell me, but I've talked to credit unions, local banks, national lenders, nobody will lend. Nobody will give an investor a line of credit. Uh, no one will. No one will do line of credit loans, line of lines of credit on rental properties. There's one credit union I found here that will, but it's 50% LTV. So I mean, you. I mean, what good would that do you? You own a $500,000 home free and clear. You get 250. I mean, it, it's not going to do you any good at all. So, um, and the reason why, and the, and the lady at the credit union told me, she said, "Listen, these." The reason why is these are extremely risky, you know, lines of credit are extremely risky loans for somebody who's living in the house. But if you're an investor, I mean, you have no, there's really no skin in the game. I'm like, what do you mean? I mean, this is a valuable asset. I'm just going to let it go. She's like, yeah, but you don't live there. And when push comes to shove, if you have to stop making a payment, that's the first one you're going to stop making because you're going to make it on the place you live. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, I mean, uh, not, I didn't mean I got a rabbit hole with that, but uh, yeah. No, so, no. yeah, I mean, great. so, uh, and, and even, even traditional real estate loans for rentals are difficult to get right now because of the same thing. You know, the, these banks and underwriters are looking at interest rates going up. It could be going into a recession. They don't want to lend to real estate investors. You know, they will, but maybe it's 60, 70% LTV, right? Uh, so you've got some serious skin in the game. So you don't just walk away, but yeah, that's, I mean, that was the risk. And, and, you know, ultimately, you know, the way I look, I mean, I, I slept a little better at night, letting all these things go or uh, I, well, I let a lot, I, I signed a lot of them back over to the original owners just so I could sleep at night knowing at least, Hey, they got bailed out once by me. You know, I gave them money 
And I made up the difference between what they were paying me in rent and what their mortgage payment was for six months to a year or two. So, and now they get their house back without even having to pay me the option fee. So I slept good at night knowing that I did that. Now for a lot of them, they left on their own. And I'm like, well, there's nothing I can do at this point. I just got to let them go. I got to, you know, I got to make a business right. decision here. But right. again, I looked at it like, well, had I not stepped in at the very end, they would have lost it to foreclosure anyway. So it's the same result. Right. So, but yeah. right. Right. And their, and their rates are probably continuing to go up, right. Cause they're adjustable right. rate mortgages. So mm -hmm. like it was yeah. just getting harder for everybody. Yeah. Um, do you think that now the interest rates are going up people? Cause sub two is a very popular, you know, there's a lot of people preaching about sub two. Do you think there's going to be a lot of people caught holding the bag who are doing all these sub two deals now that the market's potentially going down? We don't really know. Um, mm -hmm. But what do you think about that? I think that as an investor, the subject to strategy is, is the best strategy to have right now. Uh, moving do. forward. Okay. Absolutely. I mean, from an investor's perspective, it is absolutely think about it like this. I mean, I just saw something the other day, I think it was on housing wire, um, you know, a four, uh, you know, it was, it was, it was comparing two homes that sell for $400,000, one with a 7% interest rate, one with three, and the payment amount on it, right, is like difference. The, it's like nine hundred dollar difference in payment, right? So, uh, you know, if you if you're working with a seller and you're an investor and they've got a three percent interest rate or three and a half or lower, and they bought in the last five six years, chances are they've got some equity. And even if they don't, who cares? Because, you know, and who cares what the mortgage balance is if it's a three percent rate? You know, the payment's very affordable. So you, your exit strategy, you have a lot of them. You could uh, keep it yourself as a rental and cash flow it. You can um, you know, do some creative financing and sell it on a carryback. Uh, you can Airbnb it. You can VRBO it. I mean, there's a lot of different, uh, you know, a lot of different options you have when you've, when you've got title to a property and a mortgage on a property with such a low rate. So and yeah, I think when, it's a great- this I, and if you couple that with somebody who's in foreclosure, I mean, to me, the foreclosure subject to strategy is the way to go right now. You know, that's the best way to go. Yeah. Though, wouldn't though, to me, I'm like, wouldn't the, couldn't the same thing just happen again where it's literally the same thing where all these, if the homes start to go down in value, like wouldn't, if you did the I, same thing again, like, yeah. wouldn't you get well, screwed again? Now here's, here's the huge difference. And I'm glad you asked that question. And that was the point I kind of had written down that I wanted to get across in the podcast here today is the big difference, the number one difference between what happened in 2007, 2008, and what's happening in, in today is we have historically low interest rates today. Two and people are averaging anywhere between two and a half and three and a half percent, right? Back in 07 and 08, those adjustable rate mortgage uh, loans shot up and they were interest only loans on top of it. So people were not back in 07, 08, they had these adjustable rate mortgages that kept going up and up and up, and they were paying interest only. So they weren't paying any principal balance down on these houses. So they were underwater and they had mortgages that they couldn't afford. Today, there are no such things. There are no adjustable rate mortgages. A tiny percentage of our market is made up of those. So you've got people who have a solid locked in 3% rate that's not going to change for 30 years, and it includes uh, principal. So they are knocking down the principal balance of that loan month by month by month. So it's a completely different, uh, completely different environment than, uh, than we were in in 07, 08. On top of that, uh, the people who have gotten these loans can actually afford the payments. <laughs> there is no such thing as a liar loan or a stated income loan like there was in 07 and 08. Uh, anybody could get a loan. If you could fog a mirror, you could get a mortgage back in 07, 08. Nowadays, I mean, there's some pretty strict underwriting that you have to go through. So these, the, they, the banks learned their lessons, the underwriters learned their lessons, the government learned their lesson, and it made it a lot more difficult for people to borrow money nowadays to buy houses. And so the people that do, for the most part, can afford them. So I just don't see, I mean, there will be a recession. I mean, I think some people say we already are in one, although we had two quarters of uh, gross GDP decline, but then the last third quarter we were up. So who knows, but uh, depending on what your def definition of recession is, but I don't know that uh, it's going to have a huge negative impact 
overall in the housing market. Because if you think about it, and I tell people all this all the time, like my house, uh, if I were to sell my house, because um, my, my youngest daughter just turned 18 yesterday and she's going away to college uh, in the fall or in the, in the spring of, or fall of next year, it's fall of 2023, she's going to college. So my wife and I are gonna be empty nesters. We live in a pretty big house, but it would be foolish for me to sell this house and downsize because the amount of money uh, that I would, I would be borrowing, even when I'm downsizing, uh, because of the interest rate, my payment will be greater than it is where I live now. Even though this house, I could sell my house now, buy a house for half, a smaller house for maybe 40% less than this house costs, but the mortgage payment would be higher because interest rates are so high. So right. I think what's happening is people are just staying put. I mean, anybody who's refinanced right. or bought a house in the last five, six years and has a 3% rate aren't going anywhere. They're going to stay. Why so, I mean, the only sense. people who are selling right now are people absolutely have to because they've been relocated uh, or, you know, they've got to move for family reasons or whatever. Yeah. Though, if you, let's say you did sell your home and downsize, if you had a good equity spread and you paid mostly cash for it, you would actually be better off because the home prices are falling because of the interest rates. So people who are paying cash for houses right now are probably in a better position than ever in the last few years, right? Because the yeah, values are, are, are lower. Yeah, no, I, and I think, you know, there's some truth to that as well. I mean, if, if you're in a position where you can, you know, trade, like trade the equity and basically for not having the mortgage, mortgage. payment, then, then yeah, you, you're yeah, probably a little bit better said. off. Yeah. Easier said than done. <laughs> Hard yeah, to buy exactly. A exactly. But yeah. to me, yeah. I'd rather, you know, I'd rather just stay put. Right. And, hang on to that low interest rate. I mean, big picture, right? So. Right. So do you think then if the way the um, loans are structured now, were structured the same way back in, you know, the early 2000s, you wouldn't have, you know, lost everything or or no? No, yeah, I I think yes. I think had I had a business where well the, the two mistakes I made were number 1, uh uh, you know, taking subject, take, taking subject to loans or taking title subject to loans that were on adjustable rates and then uh, agreeing to um, let the, the tenants or were the former owners pay me less than what the mortgage payments were, right? Let's think about it like this. I tell people this all the time. You know, I, I don't think about it too much because it's been a long, long time since that crash happened. But I tell you, there's never a wrong time to buy real estate, only a wrong way, okay? And this is in Robert Kiyosaki's book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I remember there was a part in the book and a section in the book where he's talking about his rich dad, you know, criticizing, his rich dad criticized him because I think he bought a rental house that lost $50, was losing $50 a month. And he's like, how many more of those can you buy? And he's like, well, not very many. I can't afford to lose 50. He's like, well, how about if it was making 50 a month? How many of those could you buy? He's like, well, an infinite amount of them because they each... Every time I buy another one, it makes me $50 a month. And so I look back on it and I'm like, well, had those at least been cash flowing a small amount, hundred bucks, 150 bucks a month, I could, I would still own them today. I mean, even if the tenants mm -hmm. chose not to exercise their option to buy from me, I could have just hung on to the asset and just cash flow. Cause as long as you can cover the debt service on the property, right. Uh, it doesn't really matter what happens in the market. Markets go up, markets go down. It's your cash flowing. I mean, so, I mean, like right. I made myself a deal after that happened. Like I'm not, I'm not going to hang on to anything unless it can cash flow me at least 500 bucks a month. And I've got a number of rentals in, all in Wisconsin and the, the lowest one cash flows at like 500 net 562, 562 a month. So I don't care if that house goes down, drops in value 30, 40, 50%. What do I care? I've got a fixed interest rate uh, I'm paying down principal on the mortgage and I'm cash flowing. So I don't care. I don't care what, what, and it's my, that's my retirement, part of my retirement. So what do mm. I care? You know, I mean, it'll go back up again if it goes down. So yeah, cash and flow if they move out, it. you put another tenant in there, right? And then it's, it's the same, mm. same deal. But if you had those 50 properties and you had the same rule, I need to make cash flowing. A lot of them wouldn't have done deals with you in the first place because the only way you could have got those homes was to negative cash flow, exactly. right? So you would have had a smaller portfolio mm -hmm. of maybe a dozen, 
right, right. of profitable ones mm-hmm. versus, yeah. you know what I mean? The smart thing to do, uh, you know, I mean, you know, Monday morning quarterback, you know, 15 years later, the smart thing to do, and this was my plan. And, um, and I'm glad I at least thought and thought about it, but at this time, at that period of time, I was, uh, and I still, I listen, I believe I'm a firm believer in coaching, like having coaches. And nowadays, back then it was, you just, I had a coach, uh, but nowadays I think it's good to have coaches for that specialize in certain things. Maybe you have a coach who's kind of more mindset coach. You have a real estate coach, you have a, you know, marketing coach, whatever the case may be. But I was in a program that I paid a hundred thousand dollars for a one year program. And, uh, I mean, it was, it was a killer, uh, program because I, I, um, I doubled, I didn't double, I 10 X my investment. I made after signing up with that program the next year, I made a million bucks. What? So was, what program is this? Five. It's a hundred thousand dollars. That yeah. is insane. Yeah. So I'm in 2005, I signed up and in 06, I made a million. So I 10 X my return on, and it was mostly 99% because I was in this, 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 uh, mentoring group. So this coaching group, can you so, talk about it? What was it? I'm, yeah. I don't know any hundred grand coaching programs. That's so it insane. was, uh, it was called, uh, the name of the program was called head of the table. Uh, the coaches were Bob Proctor who passed away earlier this year. He did. Oh, uh-huh. that's a guy yeah. from the secret. He was yeah. in the secret. Yeah. He passed away that. earlier this year. Yes. Um, he was wow. in his nineties. Uh, so, and he was still doing it. He was still doing coaching. So, it was uh, three people. It was Bob Proctor. It was a Laurel Langmire, who's a big kind of wealth coach. And then it was their attorney. His name was Mark Meyerberg. So uh, the three of them put on this uh, one-year uh, coaching program. We met four times in Lake Tahoe. And we had a number of other smaller you know, co- coaching calls and that kind of thing. So yeah, I mean, they change, you know, Bob was kind of the mindset guy. He helped paradigm you, guy, right? Yeah. You know, change your, you know, your mindset, your paradigms. And then Laurel was kind of the strategic, the business part of it, right. You know, just kind of the nuts and bolts of, you know, how you, how you create a business and, you know, re, you know, increase revenue, that kind of thing. And then Mark Meyerdirk was their attorney and he helped make sure everything you were doing was legal. Right. So high level kind of legal advice. So, yeah. And, and so the one thing though, um, and I, and I tell people this all the time, the thing with coaching is, I mean, you should always do what your coaches tell you to do. I mean, if you pay them that kind of money, it's like going to a doctor. If you're not going to listen to what the doctor says or take the medicine they tell you to take or follow the treatment plan, then why are you paying them all that money to go? Uh, but, um, so when I joined the program, that program, I told them, I said, and I went into it with the 8 million and, you know, equity net worth. And I had the 55 houses. And um, again, they helped me grow exponentially. I, I have no regrets, but the one thing, and I, and I regret not following my instinct, my gut. And again, this goes back to Robert Kiyosaki and his book. I remember in his book, at some point in time, they had, they had accumulated enough uh, passive income for him and his wife to retire. It was like 120,000 bucks a year the, the, in passive income, their rentals were generating. And this, I read that book in I think 01 and this was 05. And in four years, I was at that point. I'm like, I'd had it in my head, like this Robert Kiyosaki, rich dad, poor dad, 10 grand a month, passive income, no debt, right? That's what I'm thinking. So I went through, I, and, and this was right as I was joining this $100,000 coaching group. So you had that, you said you were at 10 grand a month. Well, no, I wasn't what I was. I had this portfolio. Right. And I'm like, I looked at it. I'm like, I could sell. I had 65 houses. I had 10 straight up rentals that me and my wife just own in a separate LLC. Then I had these 55 like lease option deals. Right. Now this was Oh five before, you know, things were still going nuts. Right. And, um, I said, I went into this mentoring, you know, group and I'm like, here's what I've got. Cause you know, they go through your whole, all your, you know, balance sheet, profit and loss. I mean, it's a very strategic, you know, you go through everything and I'm looking at it and I'm going, you know, guys, here's what I'm thinking. I could sell these 55 houses. Okay. I could sell them all. Uh, and I'd have enough money from the sale of these 55 properties. I could pay off my 10 rentals, own those free and clear. And each one of them were renting between 12 and 1500 a month, right? I said, so I'd, I'd, I'd have that 12, I'd have about 
130 to 150,000 a year in passive income just from those 10 rentals. They'd be free and clear. I said, then I'd still have money. I have enough money left over to pay off my personal residence, my home, my own home. Uh, I could pay off my second home. I had a second home in Flagstaff. I could pay that off. I could pay off the, the car loan on my Mercedes. I could um, I could stick you know 100 grand just in the in a checking account or you know a money market account. And I said, I'm set. I'm I'm right where I said I wanted to be when I read Robert Kiyosaki's book, Rich Dad Poor Dad. Right. So. I'm like, I'm it. I'm this is it. And then I could retire. I'm like, I won't. I mean, I'll still keep doing stuff, but at least I can, I'm there. And they're like, no, you don't want to do that. You should not do that. I mean, they said, uh, you know, you're you're providing jobs for people. You are you were providing a service where you're keeping people in their homes. You are uh, you know, you're, you know, it was like all on and on and on. You're cleaning up neighborhoods because you're fixing these homes up. You know, you're you're providing this. And I'm like, well, I can still keep doing that, but at least, you know, I, you know, uh, but they convinced me uh, not to do that. And, and, and keep in mind, this is 2005 and we're still a year and a half away from the crash. So nobody's thinking that's going to happen. Right. I mean, no one's thinking that. And, it, and, and we would laugh about it. I remember I worked in a, I leased an office in a co-op with a couple other realtors and mortgage guys, really successful guys who also got their, got wiped out, <laughs> very smart, successful guys. And we would laugh for like, well, we all knew the party was going to come to an end sooner or later. You know, we were, no one was expecting a housing market crash or we were expecting a correction. I mean, I started going in the last six months thinking we're going to correct 15 to 20%. I've got to fat, bake that into my numbers, right? No one thought 55 to 60% crash. Nobody thought that, including these, these, I like I said, no hard feelings towards Bob or Laurel or Mark. They were giving me the best advice they thought they could give to me at that particular time based on what was going on with the economy. And, uh, but the thing is that I didn't learn until years later is all the fraud that was going on in the mortgage market. I wasn't, you know, I didn't factor that into the equation. I, nobody did like, well, I think 10 people on the planet did and they were in that movie, The Big Short. Right, right, <laughs> right, know? right. I mean, everybody else thought it, maybe it wouldn't keep going and going, but we would, and we'd see some kind of correction. So. I didn't factor that all in. So I'm like, screw it. I'm just going to keep going. I'm just going to keep buying more houses. I'm going to keep doing more lease options. You know, I'll, I'll take some money out from time to time to cover the sell some to cover the negative cash flow, sell one or two, you know, one every other month or one a month or whatever, blah, blah, blah. And just kept going. And uh, that's probably the biggest lesson I learned and the regret I have is that had I at least done that, even if I did that and then, and then I had that money from the rental income, just set aside a totally different company. I could have still kept doing all this other stuff in another LLC. And if that would have crashed, fine, boom, that goes down. But at least I still have my, my $150,000 a month and, or 150,000 a year in cash flow. So, but you know, yeah, can't. that's go ahead. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. Yeah. But anyway, you know, I think the point I was trying to make too, is like, so you, I'm a big believer in coaching, but your coaching also, the coaching has to also align with, you know, your gut instincts from time to time. Like, you know, I have a coach now, uh, I have a couple coaches, I'm a marketing coach, I have a business coach and like my business coach, you know, he'll give me advice. He's given me advice over the years that I've taken and it was the wrong advice. And I knew, I mean, don't get me wrong. The other advice he gave me more than trumped, you know, the, uh, you know, and, you know, 10 X, 20 X, but Sometimes people give you advice, you know, that you're paying and you're not thinking this is doesn't align really with my instincts here or my gut and you don't do it or you do do it and then you regret it later. So, yeah. I'm, I'm impressed with how you talk about this in like a very, um, almost like, like humble ex accepting way. Was it, did it take a while? I mean, I know this was like a decade ago, but it take a, did it take a while to come to that point because for me. I would be, I already am like very hard on myself as it is just with like small things going through that and being like, oh man, like I should have trusted my gut and I could have, I could have had the ticket and then I lost it all. Like how, how does, how did you emotionally deal with that? Cause for me, I, I would have struggled very hard probably for a long, long time. Yeah. Well, uh, so yeah, prior to the housing market crash, like I, my ego was, you know, like I thought. Yeah, I could do no wrong. And I, you know, I grew up in a middle-class family. 
mean, we didn't, we had money. We didn't have a lot of money. I mean, we didn't want for anything, but it was a pretty humble. My dad was a lineman uh, for the power company here. My mom worked as a, an assistant controller at a community college. We lived in a Yuma, Arizona is where I grew up, not, you know, a couple hours from San Diego. So, I mean, not a, certainly not a, you know, flashy type of uh, city or uh, area of the country to grow up in. So pretty humble. But, you know, when I started making 30, 50, $60,000 a month, you know, flipping these, these houses, like, you know, my ego exploded. And I just thought, you know, I bought a Rolex watch. I bought a hundred thousand dollar Mercedes. I bought a second home. Um, yeah. I just thought that I was smarter than everybody or as smart as most people and that, you know, I, I could do no wrong. So um, sometimes I, I think I look back on it and I go, it, I needed to be knocked down uh, hard because I, I was heading in the wrong direction and I was difficult to live with. My wife would tell you that. Um, my girls were really young, so I don't even really remember this part uh, phase in our lives. But um, uh, I got through it. To be honest with you, I got through it through faith. I mean, I wasn't somebody who went to church, uh, but uh, I started going. Uh, after this all happened, there were other things that happened as well. Right around the same time, my, um, my, uh, my grandmother died, which she was elderly. She was in her eighties, but I went to her funeral and I had her pastor spoke. I had no idea. She was, uh, had the faith that she had. She never really even talked to me about it. So I learned something new about my grandmother. If you know, like, wow, this is a very, uh, woman had a lot of faith. And then of course the housing market crashed. Around the same time, there was another crash. It was a helicopter crash uh, that, that happened here in Phoenix. Uh, it, two news helicopters collided. And remember, I was a news cameraman. Um, and these two news helicopters collided in midair, and it killed uh, all four people on board, uh, both helicopter, two people in each helicopter. And I knew all of them. And so I went to three funerals in one week. Um, so I had you know, the passing of my grandma, this, this helicopter crash, three of my four. And so I'm, you know, so I'm attending these church services and hearing different pastors and speak and my grandma's funeral. And then this whole thing happens. And I'm like, I got to get it together here. So I started going to church regularly. And it's really my faith, my pastor, uh, who helped me get through all of this. And um, I mean, he introduced me, my pastor did to an investor uh, at our church who was buying houses at trustee sales. Uh, and who was taking advantage of this huge, in, you know, uh, influx of foreclosures as a result of the crash. So he brought me under his wing, mentored me uh, through kind of this post-crash uh, world uh, of foreclosures. And so, you know, I mean, that's that's how I made it. You know, it was kind of uh, divine intervention, I guess. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I appreciate you you sharing that with me. That's that's rough, man. And and I. I remember you you said in the bigger pockets episode episode 1 that you know this situation of like losing everything helped save your marriage in yeah. a way. Um, yeah, no, I I mean you know, I I don't know if this is exactly how it went down, but I I'm pretty sure my wife told me at one point. She said, you know, if it wasn't for the kids, you know, you'd be gone. <laughs> so, wow. I think uh, you know, raising two young kids all by yourself is a challenge. She's like, well, he's a jerk, but he's not that big of a jerk. You know, I'll give him, I'll give him a, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt here. Cause I don't really want to have to do this all myself. And then, you know, we were ended up, our marriage is, we'll be married next year, 25 years. So she's been through a lot. Thank you. Yeah. She's, well, she's hey, if she's with you, when you lose it all, man, like, you know, you got something solid there. Yeah. You can make it through that. Right. Exactly. Um, yep. Wow. So a few more questions here. I know I, I appreciate the time you you've shared with me um, today. Uh, so Okay, so you, you lost everything. I guess you, you go through bankruptcy. How, how does one recover from that? I mean, I guess you just go back to zero. I, I'm not a bankruptcy expert. I don't understand how that works. Yeah. But like, how do you move forward after all that kind of the dust settles? So, you know, you hear a lot of people say uh, you can do real estate without good credit or without any money, right? You hear, especially the gurus, you hear say that. And it's true. You, you can, you can do it. You need money. You can use other people's money, but you need money, right? And it's really hard to get money from other people if you don't have some kind of track record, right? So the, or a proven system for generating 
income, right? right. So, uh, and I, I can give two really quick examples of this. So when I left television in 2002, 2003, I didn't really have a lot of money. I mean, my wife and I had 401ks. Uh, we had good credit. Uh, we had a couple of rental properties with some equity. We didn't have a lot of liquid cash to invest uh, in real estate. So uh, what I did is I started do door knocking and I met an investor who saw how ambitious I was and how willing I was to go knock on doors. And he said, I can help you with this. Uh, I can help you get the money together to put these deals together. Uh, and I can, you know, I have buyers for these properties. So if you can just go out and get these people under contract, we can work together. So I did that. And I, I didn't make a lot of money. I'd make, you know, five, 10 grand a deal, but, uh, uh, he would put up all the money. He would give me the money I needed to give to the bank. He would give me the money I needed to give to the owner of the house. Uh, so, um, I did that for about a year and a half of this door knocking. And I worked with this guy and, Right around this time, my father-in-law, my, my wife's mom and dad came to visit us and he knew I had quit my job to do real estate. And I'm, I know he thought it was probably a huge mistake because I it was a, you know, a decent paying job with benefits. So I think he was impressed that, you know, we weren't living under the highway yeah. <laughs> and a cardboard box that, you know, I was managing to get the bills paid. So he asked me, how does this work? So I sat him down and I, I don't know, at that point in time, I had like 40 deals right in a spreadsheet uh, that I'd done. And I showed him the money that was made total and then how much of it I got, which was a third. I shared it with him and one other partner. And he's like, why don't you keep all the money for these? You're doing all the work. You're doing the hard part. I'm like, well, I don't have the money in need. I need to close 40 deals in a year. I don't have that kind of cash. He's like, well, I do. I'll give it to you. And it was all because of that little spreadsheet I had. I had addresses of houses, what we bought, what we sold them for, you know, what after the dust settle, what the net profit and what year like, is this around? That was 0203, right? Okay. So, so he's like, well, I'll give you the money. And then uh, he did. And that was kind of, I call that love money. That was love. He, he did it because he loved me, but he saw that it worked. So then next thing you know, I had friends and family and acquaintances who were like, wow, what do you do? I'm in real estate. Well, how does it work? Well, here's, here's a list of the last 10 deals I did. Well, can I get in on this? Can I, can I put in some money? Right. So it's a track record that I had. Well, when the housing market crashed, I mean, I still had a track record. I mean, yeah, I got wiped out, but just about anybody who had any kind of business sense or knew what was going on in the world knew pretty much everybody got wiped out when the housing market crashed, right? So uh, anyway, I had a new investor that I met through my church, my pastor, and, and, uh, and um, I went to work for him as a project manager. He would buy these houses at trustee sales here, and he would... Um, just do very simple, basic lipstick on a pig type rehabs. And then he would sell them. And his margins weren't great, 10, 11, 12,000 bucks, but he was doing 15, 20 of these a month. And these were newer homes, like new, new construction. So they didn't really need a lot of work. So I worked for him as a project manager and as his realtor. And about six months into it, um, I get a call from a friend of mine who I eventually, his name is Manny Romero. He became my business partner and we're still friends today. Uh, but uh, Manny calls me up. He's like, hey, bro, what are you up to? And I'm like, I'm working for this investor. He buys houses at trustee sales and he um, you know, puts a little bit of money into them. And he's like, well, how does it work? And I'm like, well, I got like four of them I'm working on right now. I'll take you and show you. So I went and showed him the houses. I mean, I knew what he was buying them for. I knew what he bid on them. I knew what he was selling them for. And I knew what the rehab budget was because I did the rehab. I was his project manager. So I had like a spreadsheet, about 10 of them. And he's like, uh, He's like, well, can I get in on this? And I'm like, sure. He's like, well, me and my dad got, you know, 120 grand. We could, you know, loan you. I'm like, okay, let's do it. So boom, it started all over again. You know, it was like a little spreadsheet with 10 houses. So it's like, like 2008, I, coaching... I guess. What's that? Is this 2008 at this point? Uh, 2009, or... 2009. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I've never had to, since then, I've never had to worry about capital, you know, working capital, raising capital, hard money. I just, you know, I have investors you know, a handful of them that just want to invest in my deals just because of the, the track record. But can I, give, right. can I give your audience a little tip on how they can do this, even if they don't have uh, the deals themselves? Let's do it. Let's do All it. Right. So this is great. So I just told my coaching client this because he's, he needs more, uh, he needs um, some additional capital. He wants to start buying houses at trustee sales here in Phoenix. So here's what I told him. I said, his name's Alan. Great guy. I said, Alan, uh, I was like, I said, here's what you need to do. I said, you've been tracking these houses 
at trustee sales here in Maricopa County the last six months, right? Yeah. I was like, so you know you can go online and find out what the third party bidders paid for these houses, right? And he's like, yeah. And I was like, okay, so go do that. Get the addresses of 10 houses that have sold in the last six months at these trustee sales and put it into, put the address into a spreadsheet, the date it was purchased and the purchase price, the amount, right? I was like, now, and he, he has MLS access, but you could still do this if you didn't have MLS access. Say so now go online and find out what they sold for, right? What they, what after the renovations were done, right? So I was like, just put those two numbers in there and then just guesstimate what the rehab is going to be. Cause you can look at the photos on mm -hmm. Zillow or, you know, realtor.com and, and you can go, yeah, that's about a $60,000 rehab. And then, and then, you know, add 10% for commissions, closing costs and what the profit is. I said, go get 10 or 12 of those. And I said, and go to anybody, you know, who's got money and wants to invest and show and go, Hey, check this out. What do you think of these? What do you think of these numbers? Right. And the guy's making 30, 40, 50, $60,000 a house. I'm like, wow, that's, that's killer. I'm like, yeah. He's like, are these your deals? I told him, I go, I just say, they're going to ask you these. No, this, this is, these are the numbers that people are getting buying at trustee sales right now. I can get the same kind of returns, but I just need uh, a gap funding partner. Or I need a hard money lender, whatever the case may be, you know? Mm, so you can, you can use somebody else's track record to back up your case that you, you would be a fool not to invest money with me and my projects. You're right? selling them on the strategy, not necessarily you on the, Hey, the strategy works. Yep. And regardless of me, like yep. it's, it's a safe bet, right? Exactly. Exactly. So uh, makes sense. Makes sense. Okay. So you're, you're at like 2008, 2009, it sounds like, okay, you became pretty well connected. You're good to go. Um, did you like, are you able to like, even to this day, like get mortgages and loans and stuff? I guess, can you build your credit back up after that? Type oh of yeah. Yeah. That situations? Whole, okay. So I didn't actually file BK until 2009. I think it was 2009 uh, when gotcha, I went through the gotcha. BK, but um and they, I think they say it lasts, it stays on your credit report for seven years, but I bought, um, I bought my house, this house I'm in now, I bought it in 2010. Yeah. And um, really? so I was only a year and a half removed from the bankruptcy and I got a traditional loan. I, I put, I had to put like $90,000 down, but yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah. Interesting. I think, I think the stigma behind all that is you know, is made out to be maybe a little more, maybe worse than it really is. Um, but we, I mean, we both got, my wife and I, and we was a chapter seven. Uh, so like the worst one you can do. <laughs> Did you lose but, your like house and car and all that stuff? I don't well, know. Well, at that, that time works. we didn't even have a house. I mean, we had, okay. we had, we had to get out, you know, the house we had that we lived in was underwater. I mean, I sold, I basically, I, I tell people I was selling the furniture to stay warm. I mean, we actually, we sold the house we didn't get any money. We, we basically were able to sell it for what we owed on, on our primary residence. And then we moved into a rental. Um, you know, I sold the Mercedes, sold my, I sold my Rolex to a pawn shop. I mean, it was bad. Right. And so every month I would sell something to, you know, help pay the bills. Right. And then uh, in 2000, the end of 2008, beginning of, oops, beginning of 2009 is when I, uh, I met that investor. And by the end of that year, I think I made like 90 grand just working for him as a project manager. So, gotcha. so the following you're, you're year good. then in 2010, we were able to, I mean, we had, we had credit cards, we were making payments again, uh, you know, regular payments on those. And, you know, that was enough to get us up high enough where we were able to qualify for a mortgage. Yep. So, okay. 10 years later now, here we are. What is your portfolio look like? I mean, this is a question that most people ask like right in the beginning of the podcast, which made sense, but like, what, what are you currently, like, what do you currently have? What are you working on today now, 10 years later? So I have, let's see, I have about a half a dozen, I love Wisconsin. So I have about a half a dozen rentals there, a couple duplexes. Um, and uh, so that's kind of my buy and hold strategy. I don't own any here uh, just because they don't cash flow as well. Although I kind of regret the last five years, um, just because yeah. you could have bought something, anything, and it would have like doubled in value. And even if you were again losing money every month, the appreciation would have more made up for. It. I don't know, maybe I end up in the same boat as I did in 07, <laughs> 08. Yeah, but, we'll see in two years from now, right? Yeah, but, exactly. Yeah. So, 
Uh, and then I have uh, a handful of um, fix and flips I'm working on. Um, so, and Wisconsin and here. So, I mean, I don't have a huge rental portfolio. So um, I'm still probably about 15 to 20 doors away from being where I want to be with that, you know? So, yeah, I mean, it's not um, nothing that impressive, I guess. So, yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. Can, can, can I ask how much, you don't have to share if you don't want to, but can I ask how much you're, you're netting from all these types of uh, investments that you, you have coming in like passively and actively? So, yeah, it's about a quarter of a million a year. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. And is that tied to working or can you just peace out if you wanted to for six months? And well, so like, well, I'll give you an example. Like I've been the last three years, my primary revenue source has been fixing and flipping houses in Wisconsin uh, from Milwaukee virtually. all the way up to virtually yeah, from long distance. Yeah. I have a whole two teams there and, and that's what they do. Yeah. Uh, they, um, they rehab and uh, the houses for me. And, you know, I show up once or twice a year, just make sure everything's cool. And then through that, I've been able to keep, you know, a handful of them uh, as rentals. So uh, I haven't done any fix and flips in Phoenix in probably three and a half, four years. Yeah. So, so yeah, it's about, I, it's about 20 to 25 houses a year I fix and flip. And so they, you know, they net about 20 to 25 grand in profit each on average. So gotcha. Yeah. How do you, do you like fly in contractors or something? How do you manage contractors that far away? Or do you have a good like PM, I guess there? Well, I have a project, contractor? two project managers there. And, you know, with today's technology, it's pretty easy to, right. So your project manager's at the house. You're like, well, show me what the roof looks like. We, I paid to have the roof done. Uh, what's it look like? Let me see it. You know what I mean? Like with it's, FaceTime gotcha. and Skype and, uh, uh, you know, camera phones, like you can verify things have been done pretty easily. Like my project manager is funny. He's got, you know, he's deals with all the excuses, right. Of the subcontractors. Like one of our subcontractors is like, yeah, I can't, um, I can't make it today. I had a flat tire on my van. He's like, okay, well send me a picture of it. I want to see a picture of the flat tire on your van. And he never heard from the guy again. So <laughs> the yeah. guy was lying. The BS you know, meter. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so what tips would you give investors who, well, I guess, let me ask you this first. What do you think the, it's going to happen in the market in the next six months and maybe in the next three years? So uh, I think, I think we're definitely going to continue to see a correction take place uh, in the housing market and overall, and depending upon what market you live in, it could be more extreme than others. Uh, you know, Phoenix, where I live, we could see yet another 10 to 15% correction uh, in, the, in the market. So I think I just saw the other day that the median price right now in Phoenix was 344,000. And I think we were up to almost 390. So we've already seen, you know, a good 10% correction already. And since the beginning of the year, so I would at least forecast in another 10 to 15% here over the next 12 to 24 months. Um, but so much of this is predicated on what the Fed does. Uh, Cause I think a lot of people are speculating that we'll see interest rates go back down middle of uh, next year or the end of next year, back down into the fives. And if that happens, then we could be, you know, kind of heading right back where we came from just a short period of time. So I'll go, cause all of this, this, uh, price correction, lack of demand uh, is, is, is a result of these interest rates more than doubling in the last 12 months. Had that not happened, I don't It'd think anything be... would have really changed. You know, right. So it feels to me kind of forced and artificial, right? So, uh, yeah. and then if you factor out what we talked about earlier with a lot of people just hunkering down because they like their 3% rate, um, you know, it's hard for prices to go down too much if there's no houses even available for people to buy, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, and I still see, you know, I talk to, you know, I, you know, my thing is foreclosures, you know, my, since I've got into the business in 2003, 2002, I, my thing is my acquisition strategy, my buying strategy has almost always been foreclosures, pre-foreclosures, and at the auctions, trustee sales or sheriff sales. That's pretty much where I've always got my deals because I hate direct mail. I hate banded signs. I hate text messaging. Uh, I want to talk to and deal with 
homeowners or properties that are distressed. I, I hate sifting through hundreds and thousands of leads and calls. So my thing's always been foreclosures. So, uh, you know, as long as, um, and I, I'm now I've kind of lost my train of thought where I was going with this, but um, you can always in the marketplace, you, you can forecast things going up and going down into your numbers, right? You can just kind of forecast that into your, into your overall approach Plan. to buying houses. So, um, gotcha. so gotcha. if I'm doing that, then, you know, and, and I'm, and I'm getting a good deal on in the first place, then, you know, like you said, you make your money when you buy not when you sell. Yeah. I, I find a lot of investors. So I, I do PPC for, you know, paid marketing for, um, 30 investors or so. And mm -hmm. we've seen in the past, you know, since June to now, and it seems to be getting a bit worse, but a lot of investors are pausing their marketing. I don't think it's just with me. It's just like in general, a lot of investors are cutting back. They're kind of, the quote we hear is like waiting for the market to adjust or waiting to see what happens. Um, curious what you think if you were, let's say a flipper or a wholesaler, um, do you think that there is a strategy that you know you would take now because I have seen a lot of investors like we can all speculate what's going to happen, but I know for a fact investors are changing their strategies right now at least with their mm -hmm. budget, with their marketing, um, with their risk tolerance. Um, so I'm curious, like if you think there's anything else besides just say factoring in twenty percent, you know yeah. that you, that you would do. Well, I mean, I think you're also going to want to factor in longer holding, more holding costs, longer holding times, right? Um, but I, I know right now I look at a house and I'm like, if it's worth, you know, if there's three comps for 400,000 today, or that have closed, well, I tell my coaching clients, I'm like, don't even look at anything that closed six months ago. I mean, interest rates were 3%. You need to be looking at stuff that's closed in the last 60 to 90 days where the, the borrower got a 6% or 7% interest rate. Right. So that's where you start. Uh, but if you can find, you know, comps that support a value of 400,000 at a 6% interest rate, uh, maybe you factor in another 10% off of that or 5% off of that. It, it, you know, if your exit strategy is to fix and flip, right? I mean, it's, it all boils down to what your exit strategy is. I mean, if, you know, rents, you know, I'm, I've, I'm reading are coming down a little bit, but I mean, if you can buy a property, uh, you know, and, and you can make the numbers work at 7%, if that's what your interest rate is on your investor loan, you know, that you're then, and you can get whatever it is you, your set return on investment target is. If it's, I always hear people say, you want to get 1% of, of the capital that you invested in the deal. So if you buy a hundred thousand dollar house, you want to get a thousand dollars a month in rent. So whatever your numbers are, if you can make it work, but you have to do some forecasting. And if you're going to be doing any kind of investing right now, you have to kind of, I don't want to say speculate, but you have to kind of, hope for the a best, but assume the worst, you know? So, yeah, I mean, and here's, here's the thing. I will tell you this, is that my strategy, buying strategy has been foreclosures. Uh, and then that's my acquisition strategy. And my exit strategy has been fix and flip or buy and hold one or the other, right? So as long as I can make my numbers work, you know, I will continue to do that. I'm continuing to do that now. But I will say this on the fix and flip side, that exit strategy side. I mean, it is going to have to be a killer, killer deal for me to, to do a traditional fix and flip right now, because you're going to have so much capital invested in the project, number one. And number two, skilled labor is really difficult to find and material costs are sky high. So, I mean, it's just got to be like a home run deal before I would go, yeah, okay, I'll do it, right? So, because even Tim, the last two, three years, I tell people like for my fix and flips, like I'm kind of embarrassed about the finished product because I didn't have to really do much and they would sell for top dollar, right? Uh, or sell for five or 10% over even my asking price because people were so desperate to get into a home. I mean, going back three, four years ago, I mean, I did like HGTV quality rehabs. Like, I mean, if you go to my YouTube channel I and mean, you can see stuff I did three, four years ago, I mean, it looked like, yeah, it was absolutely gorgeous. And we would do all these cool design things with the homes, you know, we find all this kind of cool stuff, you know, like exposed brick and beams and, you know, Roman tubs in the bathroom and all this stuff, like that just would blow people's doors off. Like this is a beautiful home, right? You should have your own show. And, uh, but then the last two and a half, three years, I started realizing, I'm like, you don't need to do any of this stuff. 
you just make got to make the house move in ready, clean and move in ready. And people will buy it and, and they'll pay top dollar for it. You don't need to do a $100,000 HDTV rehab. So, but I tell my clients now, I'm like, who are fixing and flipping? I'm like, you have to do, you got to do those kind of rehabs now because the market's corrected and the buyers out there right now today want to see, aren't going to buy a crappy house that needs new, is going to need new windows and a roof in three years and has cabinets from like 1987. You know, yeah, it may be clean and neat, and move in ready, but it doesn't look like 2023. So you're going to have to spend a lot of money and time to get it to look like that. So if you are going to do that, you better make sure you got a nice fat spread because otherwise, you know, it's not going to be worth your time. So what should investors do instead? If they can't find these home run deals for flips, what do you recommend as a good, good strategy? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm still finding them. They're just fewer and far between. I think if you want to fix and flip, you know, again, I, I, you know, you can't do it the traditional way, you know, finding these deals through wholesalers or off the MLS. I mean, you've got to get off your butt and do some of the stuff I talk about in my book. You know, you've got to get either do the door knocking or hire some people to do the door knocking and get out and kind of create your own types of deals. Uh, because the traditional way of doing it, like even when I was doing it three, four years ago, where I just go on the MLS, oh, REO or just a distressed house, you know, write an offer on it, get it. Uh, or, uh, you know, I had whole, I have wholesalers here in Phoenix and in Wisconsin, and I, I was buying 20, 30 houses a year from those guys and they can't even find this stuff anymore, you know? Mm. So, yeah, I mean, if your strategy is to fix and flip, then, you know, I would say you're going to probably do fewer of them. Right. Uh, but you're going to want to get those better margins. So you're going to have to change up, you know, your marketing and your acquisition approach. Yeah. Should investors be worried? about the upcoming potential market crash? Well, I think the ones who, if we're talking about fix and flip investors and you have razor thin margins on your deals, yeah, you should be worried. You're probably going to lose money and you're not going to be able to sell the house as fast as you thought or for as much as you thought. So you're probably going to lose money. Um, if uh, you're a buy and hold investor and you're cash flowing, no, I don't think you've got anything to worry about. I mean, tenants... Like I have tenants in all my rentals right now. Uh, I mean, they've all been in the in these houses. I think the the lowest, all of them have been in my houses at least two, two and a half to three years. So I think if you're a buying old investor, you don't, you just, you're cash flowing, great. I mean, if you're losing money every month, then you, you again, you're going to be worried because you're, you're bleeding. And on top of it, uh, you've got an asset that's worth less than it was six months ago, 12 months ago. So that's not a very good position to be in. Yeah. I mean, if you're wholesaling, well, um, again, just make sure you, you know, your pencil's really sharp because there are fewer and fewer cash buyers like me who are going to buy from you unless, you know, you've got some, you've got some good numbers, you know, you've got a, a nice margin there. Right. Yeah, we have found it harder to move some deals this summer yeah. as wholesalers, uh, for sure. So la last couple of questions, I'll let you go. appreciate your time. Uh, if someone put a gun to your head and said, Marty, you need to get a deal, a wholesale deal in 30 days. You had to do it. 30 days or you're done. What would you do? Had to get a deal, 30 days. So I would go, just like we've been talking about, I would go the pre-foreclosure route. I would download every notice, depending upon where you live, it could be a notice of foreclosure, it could be a notice of trustee sale, notice of sheriff sale. I would download every single one of those. I would check with the attorney, make sure that the case is still active. And then I would go knock on their door. Uh, then I would uh, go by again uh, a week later and I'd go three days. I'd go at least two weeks, 30 days to two weeks out. Then I'd go again a week out. Then I'd go three days out, two days out, one day out. And I would not, I would not stop trying to talk to that homeowner about their foreclosure until they gave me the... Uh, F off treatment and said, don't ever come back here again. I don't need your help. Uh, and I would do that with every property that's on my list. And, you know, I think if you took that approach, uh, then most likely, I think that's your best, your best chance. And the great thing about that strategy is all you need is a laptop, a car, and a tank of gas, right? You don't need anything else. You don't, you don't need direct mail marketing. You don't need CRMs. You don't need any fancy technology or automation. You're not doing lead generation and prospecting. You are physically going to houses that are in foreclosure and there are sellers living in those homes that have to sell. 
So that's, that's what I would do. You're that confident in that strategy. That is what you would do. If you, if you were pushed against the, the wall 30 days, I mean, you've been doing it right. So, yeah. Yeah. so tell me about why, why did you write this? Tell, tell us about your book and why did you, why did you write a book? It sounds like you're doing well with real estate already. Yeah. Why go through the trouble? So I wrote the book. I don't want to sound sappy. I wrote the book for my daughters, really. Um, the book's mm. called Foreclosure Secrets. And uh, about this time last year, October last year, I was sitting around thinking, and I'm like, I have a coaching program on how to fix and flip houses. The company is called Fix and Flip Hub. And it's a coaching company that I started in 2016, where I just teach people how to fix and flip a house, right? Simple. And But the key, uh, a angle to that or what makes it different is, is that I teach people how to fix and flip houses who suck at marketing and uh, don't want to have to do uh, PPC. They don't want to have to do direct mail. They don't want to have to call people on the phone. They just want to fix and flip houses. So in yeah. the coaching, I would teach them, listen, this is, I, I teach them how to build a network of deal creators, right? Realtors, wholesalers, people that are going to bring you deals. So you can just focus on the rehab side of it. So that's pretty much all my clients uh, are doing that, right? So uh, I realized though, uh, last year, I'm like, well, since I've been in real estate, my key strategy, yeah, I get stuff from realtors and wholesalers, but most of it was foreclosures, either pre-foreclosures where people would bring me deals I would partner with or at auctions, trustee sales and share sales. And I don't have a coaching program that has anything that, that explains how that works. Uh, I don't have clients who are implementing what it is I've been doing for the last 20 years. Uh, I, I don't have, I don't have a webinar on how to do it. I don't have, I don't have any videos on how to do it. I have nothing. And I'm like, you know what? I remember going way back to 0203 when I had all these crazy things happen and all these crazy, I have all these crazy stories in the book, uh, that, that have happened to me up until now. Right. But, uh, uh, I'm like, I need to write a book about this because, you know, I was doing this stuff when, you know, well, when I started, my daughter wasn't even born yet. My oldest daughter, who's now in college, she wasn't even born yet. And my youngest, you know, she actually, on the day she was born, I did a pre-foreclosure deal. On the day she was born, I was on the phone in the postpartum room with my wife, uh, yeah. putting this deal together. And I saved the house from going to auction that day. I had to leave the postpartum room, go to the courthouse downtown to pay the auctioneer to stop the auction on the day she was born, which was actually exactly 18 years ago yesterday, because her birthday was yesterday. So uh, anyway, crazy. But so I'm like, I got to write a book about all of this crazy stuff. So because my daughters were so little when I was when I started doing it, uh, they'll know like how it all how it all worked. But then I started realizing too, I'm like, you know what, this stuff still works today. It's so simple. Like I said, a car, a laptop or a laptop. At that time, they're, you know, there weren't laptops, it's just desktops, but laptop, computer, a car, and a tank of gas. That's how I, that's how I got into this business and really how I still do it because it's so simple. It's like, you know, people are in foreclosure and, and, and that's the thing like today. So I wrote the book so, for my girls so they could see, this is what your dad does for a living. This is how he's kept food on the table the last 20 years. But I thought it would really help people who are kind of stuck thinking that, oh my gosh, I have to do direct mail and I have to do text message blasting and pay-per-click and I've got to put bandit signs out on the road. Uh, and I, you know, I mean, I've got to go door knocking door to door uh, to do all this stuff. And I'm not saying that that stuff doesn't work and it isn't effective, uh, but it's expensive and it's time consuming. And it can also be frustrating if, you know, mm -hmm. you're on the phone six, seven hours a day and, you know, nobody's serious about really selling you their house. They're just tire kickers. And that's, that's not fun. I would rather just deal directly with people in foreclosure who I know have to sell. So, cause I've done all the other stuff. I've spent thousands. I did a pay-per-click campaign last year and I spent, it was $20,000 uh, in ad spend. I got one deal uh, out of it. I got 13, I spent 20 grand. I got 13 leads and I closed one deal. Now we made like $48,000 on the flip. So I got the 20, it was well worth the 20 grand, but I told the ad agency I was working with, I'm like, listen, I'm like, it's just too, too risky to have to spend $20,000 on a, on a, a lead. That's just too much. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so I'm like, yeah. I know not when I know I can just go knock, knock on someone's door and 
you know, one out of 30 times do a deal, or I can show up at the trustee sale or the sheriff's sale and, you know, at least twice a month, get a deal there. So, yeah. And it doesn't sense. cost me anything. Yeah. I, I always tell people like, I'm obviously very pro pay-per-click marketing. I run an agency for it. So obviously yeah. I'm going to say that, but like, yeah. um, it's expensive, obviously. And I'd love yeah. to see your campaign. I bet you I could make it better, but yeah. I digress. This is not a PPC call. Um, so last question I have for you, and then we can kind of, yeah, end it with the, with the book stuff. But, um, what is your current, like biggest challenge in your business, you know, day to day? Uh, I think given that I'm, I fix and flip houses, uh, the biggest challenge is just finding skilled labor and, and materials that, uh, I can buy that I can put the whole project together and, and make money. I mean, to me, yeah. If you're a rehabber or you're a fix and flip or whatever, kind of use those terms kind of interchangeably. Uh, the biggest challenge is, is, is finding the skilled labor and the materials uh, to get the project done on time and on budget. That's the most difficult thing. Like, uh, cause I, you know, I was telling somebody this, I got, um, it was in a, a guy for a reporter from fortune magazine interviewed me like three weeks ago. And he was like, he asked me kind of the, the same thing. And I told him, I said, here's the, here's the thing people don't understand. Like when a housing market, and the economy's good, right? Um, uh, houses are easy to sell. Uh, the economy's good. People want to buy houses. Uh, I said the problem, the hard part is finding deals, good deals, deals with margin. That's the hard part. So when the housing market's bad, it's easy to find good deals, but it's hard to get them sold. It's hard to get to get um, disposed of them. So I was like, there's never really a good time uh, if you're a fix and flip investor or a wholesaler, obviously because there's always a challenge. So um, yeah, that's kind of why I focus on um, uh, not deal count, but just deal quality. And I'd rather do you know, two deals a year that make me $100,000 and 20 deals, right? That make me 10, you know? So um, I'm just more patient. Uh, you have to be more patient and really, again, just kind of uh, keep your pencil sharp if you're, you know, if your exit strategy is fixing, flipping, even wholesaling, because you got to make sure if you're a wholesaler, you got to make sure you leave enough meat on the bone for that cash buyer. Right. Because otherwise, they're, you know, you're not going to be able to build any kind of repeat business with them. Because every time you sell them a house, they lose money. They're not coming back. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. Is, is there anything that I didn't ask you or that you want to share uh, that we didn't touch on in this uh, conversation? Uh, can't really think of anything. We covered a lot. I mean... We uh, a lot. Yeah. I mean, I would just say, I know we talked about this earlier. If you're looking ahead, uh, there were, you know, there's not much left of this year, but, uh, and, you know, and beyond is um, uh, focus on a strategy that isn't going to, don't choose a strategy that could, you know, lead you to a place where I ended up. Right. So um, if you're, if you're, I like, and then we talked about this earlier. I like the subject to approach. Um, I like foreclosures and I like combining the two and doing foreclosures plus subject to. So it's finding foreclosures and, and, and working with sellers and you doing subject to deals. I think that's the best strategy. But um, if, because you, you're going to have a, a really low interest rate locked in and you're getting a really good deal on top of it. So yeah. And as long just, as you're positive cash flowing, you're good to go. Right. Or, or you, you've got enough margin. And, you know, you want both, right? Like if you're going to do a subject to deal uh, that you're going to fix and flip, you got to make sure there's margin in there on top of it. But yeah, I mean, if it's more of a turnkey type house, then you don't have to worry about that. You could just make slap on a coat of paint, stick a tenant in there, you know, uh, and rent a house that you got a $1,200 mortgage, you rent it for $1,500 and you're cash flowing 300 bucks a month or you Airbnb it or whatever. Yeah. So if people want to learn more about, you know, about you, if they want to connect with you, if they want to get your book, where can they get your book? How much does it cost? You know, yeah. how much money are you making from this program? You know, just share, share all the yeah. stuff, you know. So the book is called Foreclosure Secrets. Well, the book book's called Foreclosure Secrets. The website's foreclosuresecrets.net. And the book is free. It's uh, just, you got to pay shipping. It's $9.95 for shipping. And when you get the book, in addition to the book, you get uh, the digital version right away. So as soon as you buy the book, it'll get shipped to you within 
three to seven business days, but then you get the digital version so you can start reading right away. Uh, I also give you a 30 day email course, which takes you step by step. Each day you get a little actionable item so that you can in 30 days uh, find a foreclosure deal, a pre-foreclosure deal, and you'll have all the tools you need to close a deal. I, as a bonus, I give the readers that uh, buy the book, uh, they get the purchase contract that I use, loan authorization form, uh, and just uh, the step-by-step instruction that you need and what, what to say to homeowners in foreclosure, uh, what to write on a letter to give them. I mean, it's all, it's all part of the book is, is uh, bonuses. And then if they like what they're reading, but they feel like they need more help, there are several links in the book uh, where they can go to, to book a call, a strategy session with me or someone on my team. And I think that link is foreclosuresecrets.net slash talk. But when you get the book, you'll, you'll get emails with that link and um, opportunities to, to book a, a strategy session. And then in that strategy session, we go through your business, figure out what your strengths and weaknesses are, look at your market, where you're at, where the foreclosures are, and just figure out uh, if you need more help and we can go from there. Marty, I appreciate you sharing. Uh, we've been here a while. Thank you for taking all this time with me, for sharing your story, sharing our lessons, and for giving away all this free content for everybody. Um, so again, I, I really appreciate you having you on. Let's let's talk again, bring you on another time down the road. Maybe if the housing market does crash in three years, we'll bring you back on to see uh, see what other good stories we have to talk about. But Marty, thanks again for, for being here today. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. And if you made it to the end of this interview, congratulations. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Should I, should I publish? Uh, should I, pu- you think I should cut it? Should I cut some things out to make it shorter? But Hey, my podcast episodes are long, man. Like people are here and you know, we go, we go, we go deep. We go deep into topics here. That's, that's why people listen to me. So. I like it. Very good. <laughs> uh, all right, man. Thanks, Marty. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you.